Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Monday, February 27th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting public hearings on certain fiscal year 2024 department budgets. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for February 27th, 2023. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during tonight's public hearings. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input for the public hearing they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which public hearing you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which public hearing you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh. Here. Council members Farber. Here. Jones. Here. Resnick. Here. Roussel. Here. Sprank. Here. Wethel. Here. Thank you. And City Manager Van Milligan. Here. Thank you, Mayor Cavanaugh. I will turn it over to you. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. It's good to see everybody here tonight. Look excited, ready to go. Yeah? Right? All right. Perfect. Well, we're excited to have you. I'm, it's always, um, I was just talking to Council Member Roussel. Um, it's nice to, it, we really enjoy this moment to see everybody in the year, to be able to have these discussions and just see the folks that are doing all this work all the time because um, we know everything that's going on behind the scenes, but we really like to get the, the full picture of it and see your smiling faces every once in a while too like this. So we're excited to start with health services tonight. So I'll invite Mary Rose Corrigan to the, to the stage, please. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I'm Mary Rose Corrigan. I'm the Public Health Director, and I'm gonna talk about the fiscal year 2024 Health Services Department budget. So the mission of the Health Services de Department is to provide effective and equitable public health services to prevent the spread of disease and other health conditions while promoting the health, safety, and well-being of our citizens and the environment. Our staff is seven, a little over seven full-time equivalents. Um, it includes myself. We now have three sanitarians, Tim Link, Sydney Altoff, and our new sanitarian, Don March, that uh, was approved in this current year's fiscal budget by the City Council. Um, confidential account clerk, Connie Miller. And we have two full-time animal control officer positions. One is, um, awaiting being filled, and the other is staffed by Mackenzie Flanagan. And here is everybody with their sm fresh smiling faces, as you said, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> um, a few of the highlights from the past year, uh, the food sanitarians, environmental sanitarians, completed FDA standardization um, for food inspections, and this is a requirement of the Department of Inspections and Appeals contract. Um, we also had a staff complete the FDA Special Processes Retail course, and they both did quality assurance inspections. And this is to make sure that they're all co inspecting consistently across the board, only uh, amongst our department, but across the state also. Um, we secured the maximum three-year renewal contract with the Department of Inspections and Appeals for um, food inspections. We uh, secured a four-year contract renewal with the Dubuque Regional Humane Society. Uh, the Crescent Community Health Center added their quick care clinic actually in about 2022 sometime, and now that's fully up and running. And of course, you've heard about all year long, our ongoing pandemic response our incident management team and ongoing planning. So for the future, we're looking forward to doing a few things non-COVID related. Um, that includes reviewing our pet data contract and um, studying 
in-house pet licensing in conjunction with the new finance system or possibly going out for RFP for a new system. Um, we will continue with our FDA food protection standards as required by the Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeals. And uh, one area we're working on in the brain health area is working on staff education for staff dealing with citizens with brain health issues, and that's many of our field staff. The Crescent Community Health Center is going to expand their wellness and dental services. Um, we are planning on updating our public health preparedness plan, um, doing more education and training for staff in the community, and our continued response efforts and improving our capabilities. We'll be doing the community health needs assessment this all through this year. And of course, onboarding our new environmental sanitarian or emergency preparedness planner and the full-time animal control officer. So the um, FY 2024 requested property tax support for the health services department is just a little over 771,000. And that's $11.14 for the average homeowner's um, cost for health services. We always um, do our services with a focus on sustainability, resiliency, equity, and compassion. And uh, we do that in a number of ways, but a couple of the highlights that have been very successful are allowing um, credit card payments for licenses and other services. And in FY22, we we brought in over $47,000 in revenue just through credit card payments, and in FY23, that was about $39,554. And this um, helps facilitate late payments or multiple past due licenses, um, whether it's for food or other inspection services. But the other thing it does is because many of these can be not over the phone, it can remove barriers of transportation. Also, many people don't have a checking account. So it ultimately improves compliance and it also reduces the number of citations, court appearances, and fines. And we always work at translating our pub published information and our educational materials. Um, we have many languages to help facilitate food inspections. Um, when a language barrier exists between one of our sanitarians and either a chef or someone working in a, the kitchen, the inspector can point to a question and the chef can point to the answer. And so we, we can have a better assurance that they understand the processes and the code. Um, we last couple years been trying to keep track of minority-owned businesses in the city. We have seven new minority-owned businesses in FY22 for a total of 47. <clears throat> Our environmental health activity does a variety of things beyond food inspections, and that includes um, licensing and inspecting swim public swimming pools and spas, tattoo facility inspections, nuisance control, and of course public health preparedness and response. This is a look at how many food establishments we've had licensed since FY 2017. And you can see we had a big peak in um, 2019 and then a big dip. And obviously I think we can all um, think that that was a big part of that was the pandemic, and those numbers are starting to come back up. And that 459 number is as of right now. It's just a point in time number. We can't really get those numbers on a time frame, so those numbers are always about this time of year. And also our food license revenue has been increasing, and. And this is also due to we had a state increase in those fees several years ago. Every year we have quite a few establishments that new ones, they change ownership, or they go out of business. And um, we get th new things like food trucks or new caterers. And um, that, for the past um, couple years, that numbers um, remain fairly steady. And, and we hope to see the new category continue to increase. 
So this is kind of a five-year trend line on all three of those, change of ownership, out of business, and new establishments. And um, again, all three of those numbers are starting to go up again. Just to give a sense of the most common food inspection violations noted when our inspectors are out, um, the number one is 32% of establishments don't properly um, supply their hand washing sinks or make them accessible. And this is a very important um, point for food establishments that employees have clean hands. Um, other common violations are employee health reporting, keeping food contact surfaces clean and sanitized, and proper refrigeration and freezer temperatures. Like I said earlier, the sanitarians completed um, a five-year self-assessment of all nine standards. Um, we did receive a grant to do a comprehensive strategic improvement plan on our standards, and these are basically our how we do business, how we inspect, how we track. <clears throat> the ones in bold are the ones that are completed and submitted, and the other ones are the ones we'll be continuing to work on. Nuisance control is a big part of what the sanitarians also do. Um, these, this is the number of complaints that include uh, nuisance complaints. Um, in, during the pandemic, I think it was in, during FY 20 and 21, housing, the Housing Community Development Department um, took over weed complaints. Um, and we both departments used to do that, and now they're, they're continuing to handle those. So these include basically nuisance complaints. And there again, you can see a, a, a dip during the pandemic, and it went back up again, unfortunately, this year. Although this year's numbers are not trending um, to be as high as they were last year, which, which is a good sign. We don't want these numbers high. And likewise, we, we do enforcement, either citations, or hire a contractor for the cleanup or both. And uh, again, that was pretty low during the pandemic. Last year, it went up again, um, but not as high as previous years. The other inspections include hotels, pools, tattoo parlors. Um, the most common pool, swimming pool violation is record keeping. There's a lot of record keeping that has to go on. In our animal control activity, the number of complaints received was pretty similar to last year. And our police department takes care of those animal control issues when animal control isn't on duty, so we also track them. <coughs> our animals are taken to the Dubuque Regional Humane Society for impoundment or if they're stray, where they can be claimed by the owner. Um, the public also takes stray animals to the Humane Society. So those numbers are also climbing back up after um, decreasing somewhat in the pandemic. Our pet license um, sales <coughs> have uh, basically continued to increase, a slight decrease, about 4% um, from FY21 to FY22, but this year, um, in terms of revenue, we're on track to um, meet our FY23 revenue projections, so that's good. I think part of the reason for that dip in sales was catching up on past due licenses. Um, we basically didn't do enforcement on that for about a year and a half, so we had a big um, backlog, but we're, we're, getting, we're working on it. Animal control is all about public safety, so we follow up on animal bites that are reported, um, dog bites, cat bites, and some other animal bites occasionally. Those are trending upward also, um, not as high as they were a couple years ago, but there's the overall trend line. Um, back up last year after that dip during the pandemic when fewer people were out and about, I think. That's another number we don't want to see increase. <laughs> Likewise, cruelty and neglect investigations unfortunately continue to go up. And this, is a, this takes an effort between police and the county attorney's office and our animal control officers. Um, can be very time consuming. Um, 
a lot of these don't end up going to court or have a citation filed because the owner will um, sign their animals over to us so that they can get the proper care they need. And um, at that point, we don't pursue um, uh, court action unless it's a multiple offender, things like that. The, the main thing is to um, have the animals be safe and treated health, in a healthy environment. So the bulk of citations issued are for license citations. You can see that on the slide on the left in the red bars. Again, during FY22, we didn't issue quite as many. We're working on catching up with that. Um, other citations are issued in much less numbers. Typical things citations are issued for are things like dogs running loose, um, failure to confine an animal if it bit, um, not having a rabies um, current vaccination. Again, we work hard to uh, solve those issues before it gets to the citation stage. And this is uh, our pet license municipal infractions. The number in blue there are the actual ones that get filed with the court. We mail the citation or, or issue it to the person. If they correct the violation before the court date, then those are dismissed. So really only about 17% of the um, municipal infractions issued are actually filed with the court. Another big uh, activity is trapping wild, stray, feral cats, which can be a nuisance and contribute to the overpopulation of cats. So that's always ongoing. We also get requests for wild animals um, calls. Um, if they are sick or injured or causing a public safety nuisance, we'll respond to those. Sometimes we work with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. Sometimes the animals are not allowed in the city under our dangerous animal ordinance. Um, sometimes they're just a little chicken crossing the road or something like that. But we do see a variety of critters. And we also work um, with the park um, division. Uh, in FY16 and through 17 or 18, those uh, complaints were for people having pets in the parks when we didn't allow it. And since we now allow that in most parks, they're for offenses such as if you don't have your dog on a leash or you're not picking up waste, those kinds of things. But for them, and that includes trails, but the most, um, these, these uh, complaints are, are pretty minimal, which is great. I don't know that I've reported on our urban deer management program much lately, but it, it's continuing. And it started out in 1997 with a pilot program uh, at the Sisters of St. Francis property, and it's continued. And when I looked at how long that is, this year it's the 26th year, I believe, for that. Hard to believe. <coughs> um, this year, the hunters harvested a total, total of 127 deer, which is uh, way and above what's been harvested in the past few years. And um, we know that without a deer hunt, the population could increase by as much as a third every year. So this pretty much at least keep things, keeps things in check. Um, the program also provides incentive tags. If a hunter gets three does in a season, they, they can purchase an any sex or buck tag for the following year. And we also encourage them to harvest coyotes which, if you can imagine, is pretty tricky with the bow and arrow. But every year they get a few. And now I'd just like to talk to you about Crescent Community Health Center. Um, this is a community partner that really contributes to the Health Services Department equity plan. Um, Crescent continues to surpass its number of patient goals which is set by HRSA, the Health Resources Services Administration of the federal government, and that's who is there, provides grant funding for them. The patients increase, the number of patients increased 12.6% from uh, 2021 to 2022 um, to 9,248 patients who had 30, over 33,000 visits. Um, pretty remarkable for our community health center. As I said earlier, they're gonna be expanding their wellness and dental services. And the, the slide on the left is a picture of what the wellness center you know, may end up looking like, the outbuilding in their parking lot. They received a generous grant from the DRA to help with that. Um, Crescent also received a very generous grant from Delta Dental 
to uh, expand their dental services. And this is just a snapshot of the patient characteristics. Um, some of them um, have changed from recent years. Um, the black and African American patients um, grew by almost 9% from, or from 2021 to 2022. Hispanic patients increased by 15%. The Pacific Islander patients increased by 48%. And that's now 483 Pacific Islanders um, doing care at Crescent. Patients who are best served in a language other than English increased by 24%, and that amounts to 9.6% of Crescent's total patient population. Um, quite a few of the patients, as you can see, are at or below the federal poverty levels and are uninsured. The Medicaid patients increased by over almost 16% in the last year, and along with the LGBTQ plus patients. So um, Crescent's doing well on serving um, our patients and uh, all kinds of patients from our community. And since uh, brain health has been uh, on the city council priority list for a number of years, um, Crescent is working to meet that community need. Um, they have two full-time nurse practitioners and a part-time medical uh, doctor just doing psychiatry and brain health. They provide medication-assisted treatment or MAT for um, substance use for their patients. They have um, three nursing staff support. They provide therapy. Um, they have some services for same-day uh, acute intervention. So. Um, these services uh, continue to increase also every year and the patients going there. So, um, overall, the Health Services Department has a few uh, recommended improvement requests, um, some of which are equipment, um, thermometers, office chair equipment, a computer remote workstation for our account clerk, and um, an environmental sanitarian vehicle. We also uh, have an improvement package for nuisance mitigation of $40,000, and this is eventually paid because that will be assessed to the property taxes. And staff development, um, beyond the normal education and training, we, um, the National Environmental Health Association provides a credentialing exam, and one of our sanitarians will be ready to sit for that, so that has a cost. And they also have a leadership um, academy we'd like our, one of our sanitarians to attend, which includes a t attending a conference. So um, a lot of staff development in our, uh, several of our new and younger staff members. And I know you hear about me all the time, from me all the time about COVID and uh, just to wrap you know, COVID is a pandemic or a health event of a lifetime for me, and there hasn't been anything even close to it since the great influenza back in 1918, 1919, which I only read about. Um, you know, a lot of weekly meetings and presentations with our community partners and then presentations for the city council at your meetings and monthly since October. We'll be um, presenting an after action report to you in April, which will include an improvement plan of what we want to accomplish based on what we learned. And um, we learned a lot. And uh, it's things we thought we did, but we really didn't do. And so um, I, I hope to present that to you in April. Um, but with that, we had quite a few things that were delayed and we're playing catch up. And those <coughs> things include um, catching up on the required food inspections, our community health needs assessment, which our uh, partners of uh, Mercy, Unity Point Finley, Crescent, the VNA, and the city will continue to work on. Um, pet license enforcement, our lead program um, case management, and resuming community education, which has been kind of minimal over the last couple of years, and of course, catching up on staff training. So that's uh, my presentation tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, well, thank you very much, Mary Rose. You said you only read about the previous pandemic. I think you could probably write a book about this one, considering everything that you've learned and been able to <laughs> teach everyone else. So.
Questions, discussion? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Um, Eagle Point Park and Dogs, um, have there been any significant issues? Is it time to look at that restriction again from your perspective? Um, I think there have been a, a couple, you know, people can bring their dogs if they leave them in their car. And there's been a couple times people didn't leave them in their car, but it's probably, I think, because they didn't quite understand it. Um, you know, so it hasn't been a problem, but we don't allow them up there. So I think in the wintertime, people may um, have dogs up there walking, but it's, we don't really patrol up there and it's technically not open, so. Thank you. Ms. Mayor? Yeah, Ms. Barber. So Mary Rose, I want to um, uh, thank you in advance for <coughs> Don's present at our food truck events and some of the markets um, that we, uh, just so people understand, before every event where there's multiple food trucks, the inspectors actually come on board the food truck and do their inspection. And um, so I'm very pleased to see that you've got a third person to join the crew, and uh, no doubt it'll go as efficient, if not more efficient, now than it did previously. So I'm looking forward to making her acquaintance as well. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. One other quick comment. I'd, I'd argue that uh, you excelled at public education these last two years, and that the education you gave us and, and the community was, in fact, life saving. So thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Wethel, I'm checking in with you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just one question as it relates to number four. Um, currently, what sort of a vehicle or situation does the emergency preparedness planner position utilize at this time? At this time, she's just using her own personal vehicle. Um, it, it's pretty minimal right now as she gets credentialed and his um, shadowing the other inspectors, but eventually when she's out on her own. So um, she would use the city vehicle. Thank you. Right. I have a few, Mary Rose. Um, the nuisance complaints seem to skyrocket. Do you have a sense of what's going on there and why that has happened? And I guess part of my question is, um, the, are those, the numbers you showed us, are they all unique? complaints or are some of those people complaining multiple times? Do you happen to know that? A, a little of both. So the first part, um, why did they spike? It may be due to people being out and about more and seeing these problems and then therefore, you know, calling us to address them. That may be one thing and as people resume whatever they do around their home. Um, the other are they individual complaints for the most part? Yes. Sometimes uh, we have a complaint at an address, it gets corrected, and then another month later there'll be another problem at that same address. Mm -hmm. So it could be multiple complaints at that address. Gotcha. Okay. Um, animal bites were trending up as well. What you have a sense of, I know that a lot of people bought pets for the first time potentially during the pandemic that was kind of a national story but I was just curious if you had a sense of what's going on there yeah that number's been going up pre pandemic I think part of it is um, reporting is better mm -hmm. um, it is a city requirement to report animal bites and unfortunately um, they get reported when people see medical attention seek medical attention meaning the b bites severe enough that they need that which is also not a good sign so I think we're seeing some more severe um, bites. The other thing is, I think more people have pets, but more people have multiple pets. Hmm. And um, there's a lot of responsibility that goes on with owning a pet, and um, it's a big job. And so, um, you know, training and all those things are required, and that may all be adding up. Gotcha. Thank you. Something to keep on the radar for sure. Um, last thing I had on here was um, the numbers at Crescent are incredible. I mean, that's great. And I know you're on the board. I know you pay a lot of attention. You do a lot of work for Crescent. Um, you know, that's, that's wonderful news. I, I guess um, what, what has happened that has led those numbers to rise, you think? Well, I think they're, they're doing a good job of telling the community what they do and where they are. I think the addition of the brain health services and the quick care clinic has added um, patients. And, it, and if a patient goes in for the quick care, they may end up being a, 
established patient. Uh, I think uh, the variety of services and, and the population health programs they have, people who are um, from particular population, whether they're Hispanic, African American, or Marshallese, working with those people really makes a difference. So um, word gets out that it's a very accepting um, and a place that provides um, services other than just health care, and we call those enabling services to meet those social determinants of health. So Crescent has surpassed HRSA's um, requirements, and, um, and also, you know, the city, they're one of our contracted services partners to provide um, access to care, and I, I think they're really uh, rocking it out of the park, um, so couldn't be more proud of them. Uh, they've had stable leadership, um, the board is committed, and uh, it's also due to some, um, they were able to do telehealth since the pandemic and got some additional funding for those things. Wonderful. Well, thank you for all that information. That's great news, though. All right. Well, I think that's everything from us. Oh, do a Ms. public hearing. What's that? We should do a public hearing. A public hearing. Comments from the public. Oh, geez. Thanks. I am terrible at the public hearing part of this. I apologize to the public. I, I'm, I'll get this right for the rest of the night, I promise. So um, do we have any comments from the public this evening on the, on the health services budget? There's no one virtually. All right. I promise it's not, it's not because I don't want to hear from the public. We definitely do. Thank you very much, Councilman Jones. All right. Well, with that, then, we will move on to our next presentation, which is the library. And uh, we'll take a moment here to switch everything out. microphone can you is that picking up virtually huh. do you know yeah if you just point it like if you like, point it directly towards your yeah, yeah then like, you're good to go is that better that is a little better okay yeah all right great okay <clears throat> I mean, well, we are louder, ready but... when you are then okay well good evening thank you very much for having me uh, my name is Nick Rossman uh, director of the Carnegie Stout Public Library and it's my pleasure to share some of uh, our highlights accomplishments and and things that we're looking forward to uh, would you kind of start with uh, sharing our, our new mission and vision statement? So this was, uh, we developed these as part of our strategic planning process that we've been going through uh, over the last uh, fiscal year or so. Um, so the new uh, mission statement is enriching lives in the Dubuque community through experiences and resources that encourage discovery. And then our new vision statement is to improve and empower lives through accessible resources, community engagement, and entertainment opportunities in a welcoming environment. And so we currently have uh, 35.15 full-time equivalents, and that, uh, which is, that's made up of 21 full-time staff and a, approximately 40 part-time staff. That kind of ebbs and flows as uh, some of the younger students graduate from high school and you know, in and out. Um, so one of the things we, we, we've been looking at is just adding some more full-time positions, um, which is in, you'll see in some of the improvement package requests, and, and I'll address that later. Um, but I also just wanted to mention that as, uh, as I transition into kind of the library's commitment to making the city of Dubuque an, an equitable community and organization of choice. Um, and so you know, some of our impacts are, are focusing on getting some, some more full-time positions that you know, aren't necessarily a needed degree, um, which I'll cover later. But um, some of the other app, uh, efforts that we've undertaken to impact equity uh, include focusing on partnerships with local organizations um, that are working with uh, specifically refugees or immigrants or, or non-native English speakers. Um, specifically, we've been trying to build a partnership uh, with the Monsoon Asians and Pacific Islanders in solidarity. Uh, we organized uh, one so far uh, story time in Marshallese at the library, and we're kind of continuing to work on how we can build outreach and partnership, continue with them. Um, we also have been looking at our policies and trying to address situations uh, to uh, achieve a more equitable approach to helping library users. Uh, one very specific example is with our internet use policy, we recently removed language that uh, only library card holders could access public computers in the library, so we would give out guest passes to visitors from out of town, but, um, which is a really great strategy if you're trying to entice local residents to get a library card, but what we really found was we were turning away a lot of students 
whose parents could or, or would not come down to get them a library card. So we really revised that policy to make it easier for staff to, to give out those guest passes, but also um, we've, we've created a, what we call an internet only uh, card for students that the parent doesn't have to actually physically come into the library. So it's just kind of trying to break, remove some of those barriers for, for getting access to computers and internet use and, and everything else, and as well as the development um, and continued partnership with the Dubuque Kennedy School Districts to get middle school and high school students automatic library cards with their, their school IDs. So we're continuing that partnership as well. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit, some of our fiscal year highlights. Um, this just kind of shows uh, the number of visitors we had throughout the year, our card holders, our, our total collection use, and just kind of highlighting our, our new story walk that's at the Dubuque Arboretum and Botanical Gardens, which is the second one for us in the city. Then we had uh, over 100,000 checkouts of digital materials. We added more than 16,000 physical items to the collection, and I want to emphasize that, that physical uh, because we also added a new digital uh, service as well called Hoopla Digital, uh, which provides over a million different digital titles across multiple formats. And so um, you can see here, this is just kind of the desktop interface of Hoopla. And when you click on that browse button, you can see the kind of the different formats. So you've got your audiobooks, comics, ebooks. Uh, the audiobooks are by far and away the most popular uh, usage of the platform, uh, then followed by the, the ebooks, and then kind of everything else is sort of a tie. Um, and then you can see kind of at the bottom of the screen there, you, you can borrow 10 more titles this month. So I must have grabbed this image at the very beginning of a month. So every the first of every month that resets uh, borrowers can have 10, 10 uses of this uh, every single month. And then just to kind of feature what the binge passes is, uh, so this screen here has uh, uh, the various options for a binge pass and what that does is so for one borrow, you have access to one of these disciplines um, for an entire week. So uh, just to be kind of specific, the great courses, which is the upper right hand corner if you're not familiar with those, um, there's over 350 different disciplines that are available in the great courses that you can access for a week. And um, it kind of varies. There's historical topics, politics, religious studies, science, arts, um, but also how-to courses. So you could learn how to play the piano. Um, they have um, kind of self-help on uh, how to be a great public speaker. So I, I need to take some of those courses myself. But it's very extensive. Um, mastering stage presence, all kinds of fun stuff in there. Um, and then just a few more uh, fiscal highlights for our programming. Uh, so we had over 500 programs for youth, over 100 for adults, and our, our total attendance was just under 12,000. Uh, we really kind of started doing in-person programming again about April of 2022. So really kind of just the last quarter of the fiscal year. So while these numbers are certainly better than fiscal year 21, um, I think we'll see even increase in numbers for, for fiscal year 23. So. Uh, and then, of course, we adopted a, a new high-level strategic plan, which is available on our website, on our About Us page, but I did bring some printed copies for, for the City Council and Mayor tonight. And, uh, and some of the people in the room uh, helped participate in that process, so we're very appreciative to, to those of you and also members of the community that were, were helpful in kind of got us gathering information from the community and helping us put the plan to work So as we continue to work forward on that. And then uh, one other big thing that we did this year, um, the, the Carnegie State Public Library, the staff, uh, our new staff published a, a board book uh, called When You Read to Me. So this was written by one of our staff members, Bailey Kamek-Gerke, is a youth librarian and edited by the youth services manager, Daniel Day, and is illustrated by Tim Reed, who's done the mural in the programming room at the library, but also has uh, illustrated several of the um, Be Healthy in Dubuque and some of those titles as well. And uh, so we're just really excited. We got um, several thousand copies that we're using uh, to distribute for our Books for Babies program, which is a, a free book to mothers that deliver in the Dubuque hospitals. Um, and we're, we have some other uses for them as well. All right, so this is uh, just kind of showing our kind of collection use for the entire year. Um, so about 34% was the, f the print materials, 30% uh, was that uh, electronic retrieval uh, of information, so database, but that also includes the Telegraph Herald archives, and, um, and then you see the 17% of the digital materials, about 15% of kind of the DVD, video, Blu-ray, uh, which, is, which is a drop for, for that medium, and um, we're seeing that, I think, streaming 
movies and t TV shows has really kind of taken a dip. So um, you'll actually see the total collection use in fiscal year 21 was about 660,000. Um, in this fiscal year 22, we're, we're sitting at 16, 617. And really almost, so that's about a 45,000 different, 45,000 usage difference, 49,000 of which is combined between the, the DVD and Blu-ray usage, but then also just the, we had a big drop in the Telegraph Herald, Herald archive usage, which I, I'm trying to figure out why, but when you look at those consecutively year after year, they kind of just kind of peaks and valleys of kind of ranges anywhere from 118,000 to 162,000 in, in a given year. So this is just a down year for that, we, we think. Uh, and then this just shows uh, what our, the bulk of our uh, expenditures go towards, so 70% uh, goes towards our staff, um, which in my opinion is one of our greatest resources at the library, and then kind of evenly split uh, between materials and operations of you know, getting new materials in the, in the building and digitally, and then also just keeping the building functional and clean and uh, a fun place to visit. So. Okay. And then this slide here, um, this just uh, focuses on how much money library users saved in fiscal year 22. Um, so kind of there's the average estimated retail price for the various uh, materials that we circulate, then the kind of the total circulation numbers for all those, and then just what the, that estimated cost savings would be. Uh, so this does not include any of the database or electronic retrieval information. This is kind of just the checkout of the digital and physical materials. Um, but you can see that a uh, little over uh, six, Six million three hundred thousand uh, dollars saved by library users in fiscal year twenty two, as opposed to purchasing those materials outright. And just kind of showing some of the the fun things we've been up to recently. Uh, we have our Beam interactive projector system. So that's that um, top right picture there. Uh, what it does is the projector projects down onto the floor. Uh, it's the exact size of a ceiling tile, so if you're not looking up at the ceiling very specifically, you probably wouldn't even notice that it's in the programming room. But all the games and educational games that kind of projects down are interactive, so it encourages uh, movement, but, um, and they're just, it's fun. So we've had, uh, had that available for about two months now, and we've been doing just open sessions on some Saturdays to, to kind of get, get that in there. And there has to, we have to put a little mat down on the floor, but. And I lost my place. Oh, here we go. Um, the Beam projector has over 100 different uh, interactive games available as well. And it's kind of geared towards three to 12 year old uh, age range. So uh, in the makerspace, we've added uh, the sublimation printers uh, going strong, really strong. And if anybody's not familiar with that technology, it's just uh, you print an image onto a special paper that then can heat transfer onto items that have a, a white background backdrop. So um, we do uh, items in there, uh, custom gifts for the koozies, mouse pads, uh, puzzles, keychains, uh, Christmas ornaments, and, and so much more. Um, we've recently added the pet tags, which you see featured here. Uh, we sell those for $5, and then you can engrave them in the library with whatever you want on them with our laser engraver. And then we've also added uh, additional 3D printers to kind of keep up with the demand of the 3D printing that we see, so, uh, which is very extensive. Um, and then some, some new items that are available for checkout. Uh, we have Steam Academy tablets. Uh, those are tablets that are preloaded with uh, apps that uh, help with uh, Steam development, but also social and emotional um, issues, and then literacy skills as well, and that's kind of geared towards preschool, um, low elementary ages, and what the neat thing about those devices is that they don't need to be connected to uh, the internet. All the apps are just preloaded, so you can just check it out, and it works in your car, or um, while you're in the waiting room, at doctor's office, or, or whatever. So uh, we also have a small collection of outdoor games. You see the ladder toss there, uh, but we also have, um, Let's see, there's a collapsible frisbee golf target, uh, ring toss croquet, and everybody's favorite bocce ball as well. And, and there's a few more that I didn't list. So, and then we've also added CD players. So we still have a, a nice collection of music CDs and audiobooks on CD, which um, CD players are just becoming more harder, you know, just harder to find. Like a lot of cars don't come with them installed anymore. So uh, we do have a few available for checkout if for some odd reason it's the only version of a book you really want is on CD book, but you don't have a CD player at home, you can just check them both out and have, have, a, nice, have a nice weekend with it. So. 
Uh, and then I just really kind of briefly wanted to share just kind of how COVID has permanently impacted library service. Uh, so we're, we're still offering the, the curbside service and it, it remains popular. We see probably about 100 uh, curbside pickups every month. Um, the, the take, take, or make and take, take and make crafting kits are still very popular. They go very fast once we, when we get them out every month. Um, the, the partnership that we built with the W Arboretum and using their outdoor space during the summer reading program for the pandemic has been uh, very well received. Previously, we've always had to do multiple um, performances with a performer in order to get all the interest into our meeting room space. So doing it, we could do one performance outside and um, a lot of people can show up and we don't have to worry about um, too many people in a confined space. So uh, we're excited about that. And then, um, I just think the, we really saw a, a significant jump in, in digital material usage uh, due to the pandemic. And while our numbers, now that things are a little bit more back to normal, our numbers have dropped just a little bit. But our, um, this year's numbers right now are trending up. And um, I think with the addition of Hoopla, that's kind of helping. But, um, but our, our numbers are still really strong with uh, digital materials. So. All right, and then through our strategic, so I'll just kind of talk about a couple of the future things we're looking forward to. Um, but through our strategic planning process, we realized that we needed to better understand uh, our, the needs of our space um, and what, what kind of uses the community has for it. Um, so what we want to do a, a, a space needs or library use assessment, uh, what they'll be looking at there is um, uh, just kind of traffic patterns through the library, um, you know, how, how the staff's desks are arranged, um, what kind of, a, how you, how's your collection being used and what's the size of your collection, uh, a lot more. Um, but like one of the things we, we've kind of come across is n realizing that people have a greater need for places for like an individual or a small group of individuals to meet to have a virtual uh, meeting and we don't have a lot of space for that in the library so we have a small conference room and then our whisper room which we can kind of utilize for that but um, so kind of just trying to figure out like is there a way we can get they have pods that you can have that like one or two people can sit in there that you can close it all off it's somewhat soundproof that people could have a virtual meeting with somebody in the library and it wouldn't disturb kind of the rest of the people that are in there reading or doing homework or whatever they're whatever they're about so looking at some of those things and then we're also very excited. Uh, the Iowa Library Association Conference is going to be in Dubuque in October of this year. Um, so we'll be involved with uh, some of the local arrangements planning and, and helping plan the conference. So um, keep that on your calendars if you want to come up, hang out for an opening reception. So. And this is our requested property tax support. Uh, so we're a uh, little over $4 million in tax support and uh, it's a, an average uh, of $60.14 to homeowners uh, in Dubuque. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the gift trust balance that we currently have. So we, we're sitting on a little over a million dollars separated out of, against a few different uh, gift trusts. We have a couple of restricted gift trusts. So with the Lacey Book Trust, uh, that money uh, with the earnings for that every year, um, wrong paper. Uh, we can use that to purchase materials, uh, travel, science, fine arts, and biographies. Uh, with the Lowell Art Trust, uh, we use that specifically just to f for like framing, care, and maintenance of library-owned artwork. Uh, and then the unrestricted trust there, the James Mutzler Trust, uh, that was a donation that's designated to enhance library services. So that's the way we use it. Um, the Walton Trust is a special revenue uh, designated by the trustees, uh, the Board of Trustees, to be used for the purpose of con conservation and preservation of library materials of historic value. Uh, and then the General Library Trust is uh, just a depository for our bequests that are sometimes smaller in the financial scope, um, but has grants and donations as well. Uh, and then the, the principal or earnings are used according to typically the donor's wishes. So. And then this is just a, a further breakdown of that general trust as well. Um, you can see that, that beginning balance we've expected the 114,000. Uh, and then we've got the committed project funds which are listed on the, the right hand side there of the various, um, some of these are kind of ongoing annual projects and some of them are one time. Um, so. All right, so then for our improvement package uh, request, we had four requests this year. Uh, two of them were, were recommended by the city manager, Mike Van Milligan. We have, um, we are hoping to upgrade two existing part-time library assistants to full-time library assistants, um, bring a, an existing part-time marketing coordinator into the general fund, and then asking for $3,000 for an opening reception funds for the, the uh, Iowa Library Association conference in October. Uh, 
and I'll kind of go through those a little bit more specifically. So the one of the two circulate the the circulation department specifically has 12 part-time library assistants. Um, and we actually saw in the last year 100% turnover in those department, in that department. Not every single person left, but we, we hired 12 people. And um, we have no problem hiring really excellent candidates. Uh, but what happens then is they find full-time jobs and, and leave us. So um, what, what we're hoping to do with, uh, to get these full-time positions are um, not only provide the, a position that's non-degreed, full-time, with good pay for uh, people in our city, uh, but also for those other part-time positions, which I know we can't all of a sudden switch that to 12 full-time positions that we're, you know, we don't have that kind of money, but, um, but that creates some stability for scheduling throughout the week. Uh, we're open 61 hours, so you know there's there's somebody around that knows what's going on, that new people can come to with questions of um, policy issues or just general training and coaching as they're they're learning the job. Um, and uh, the, so this first position here, uh, that's actually a 25-hour lead library assistant, moving to 40 40 hours a week. So that position was um, recommended. And then the second one is actually a 20 hour position, so that's kind of the discrepancy and the difference in the pay. Um, why the second one's a little bit more, that one was not recommended. And then the part-time marketing coordinator. Um, so this is a position that we currently have is paid out of that Mutchler Trust. Um, this is a position that the library definitely needs. Uh, what bringing it into the general fund uh, would create this as a kind of on stand, like a standing position, no more annual contract that the board would have to approve every single year. Um, and then really what we're looking for is, and I think through the strategic planning process, we found we have a great, great need for community engagement uh, and outreach and, and connecting with the community marketing. So it's just trying to, and, and you know, whether or not a 20 hour position for that is enough. So that's something we're actually gonna be studying as we go through the strategic plan, planning process. And that need might change as we figure out what those, those needs are and how that evolves. So. Um, but this also was not recommended this year. And, and then the final one is the $3,000 for the um, Iowa Library Association conference reception, uh, which is just a, a neat opportunity to showcase the city of Dubuque and the library to visiting librarians. And uh, just as a reference, the, the 2022 conference attendance was 385 people. So it'll bring some tourism to the city. And uh, capital improvement projects. So we had uh, just one, one project approved for actually fiscal year 25, which is a water pipe replacement, uh, which is the kind of final phase of replacing all the water pipes throughout the building. So. And then just a final few slides here, just kind of going through our performance measures. Um, so we did 117 uh, readings at area child care with our uh, AmeriCorps staff. And partnership there. Uh, the leadership enrichment after school program is uh, a program that we do after after hours with the middle schools and that had been uh, postponed during COVID so that's back on now so we got 12 of those one every month um, and then that 154,000 um, children's items is our kind of represents just the physical collection which was about 54 percent of the physical collection um, checkout with and so 46 percent then for adult materials uh, and then that uh, electronic uh, information resources, that 186,000, that includes that Telegraph Herald archives, um, check out the digital materials, um, and then we had the 100 programs for adult with uh, a little over 1,900 attendees. And then um, the final slide here is just uh, the number, we have 212 items available in the collection that doesn't include the over a million titles through Hoopla. Um, and uh, the, we had about 82% of our population as registered borrowers, uh, which was about 47,000 people. And uh, we did over 300 deliveries for homebound residents in the fiscal year. And then there's that uh, almost 130,000 issues of the newspaper archives. Where, but that is all. Thank you very much. And unless there's any questions. All right. Yeah. Well, before I ask for any questions from my council colleagues, I would love to know if there's any public input this evening for this particular budget hearing. <laughs> Do we have anyone here in chambers? Seeing no one, do we have any virtual? No one virtually. Okay, thank you very much, Adrian. Back to the table then for any discussion. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Ms. Roussel. Yeah. Uh, Nick, thank you. Um, I really loved slide 13 where you showed um, the dollars that people have saved by accessing their materials through the library. And I think that's something that we don't really think about. And um, it's interesting how a person could really maximize the return they get from our library by simply accessing more materials 
through the library and not buying them. Yeah. So thanks for, for sharing that. Well, it was a really thought-provoking slide. Yeah. Thanks. Ms. Barber. Thank yeah, I was also going to make that same comment about the $6.4 million. Um, and I was uh, thinking, putting on my little marketing hat here, that you know perhaps that should be marketed uh, to the public in a very visible way, uh, because that is outstanding and um, just awesome in that respect. So just put that in your... Okay. Your marketing hat there to think about that. The other thing is I wanted to give a shout out to Tim Reed uh, because he just does such fun work and I just really appreciate all the illustrations that he does. And then my last comment relates to the titles through Hoopla and I'm extremely impressed that they still have highlights for kids. Oh yeah. Because I remember that growing up as well and that was my favorite so I'm still <coughs> pleased to see that it is still amongst those that they show for the kids. So. Thank you very much Thanks. for all that you do, and, and every year I look forward to your art uh, exhibits as well that you, okay. you show to, to basically showcase the local artist as well. And yep. that's, I think, very special in that beautiful building that you have. So okay. thank you for that, and thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Wethel, checking in. I don't have any questions. Thanks for the presentation. It was great. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much, Nick. The, the strategic plan that you handed to us, so we've got, we've got this on hard copy here. You, you mentioned it a few times during your, um, your presentation, but what's the, what's the plan now? I mean, because I know that this was a long process for you. Um, you did a lot of focus groups. You, you gathered a lot of information. I mean, it was a pretty intensive process, right? Oh, yeah. Um, what's, what's next for this? What, what can we expect to hear from this, or what can the public hear from uh, Well, right now, so we, we had to get through. We just uh, actually finalized our application for accreditation with the State Library of Iowa, which is due at the end of, it's due tomorrow, it's done. But um, so then the next step is really kind of just working through that plan and kind of developing an annual work plan um, based on you know, the, the, the long-term goals there and just trying to figure out, okay, what can we do, get done in the next 12 months and, and let's, atta let's attack it. So sure. um, that's really what we're, what we're gonna be working on pretty much over the next month is trying to develop those work plans and, and then report that to the library board and, uh, and then go to work, so. Is this something you plan to bring before the council to discuss kind of what's in it in its entirety? I was just certainly good. Yeah, I'm curious we could if that's do like something. A work that, session or something. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. yeah, and I know that you know there's there's with the library board of trustees things are a little bit different with the structure that you have. But I think um, from a public standpoint, the ability to to get that information out, I think, is really um, important. Because I was looking through that, and I very much appreciated your your presentation. But in looking through this, I mean, some of these things that are on here, you're you've got some some challenging goals ahead of you, and it made me recognize that. You know, so much of what we talk about here is how things change over time. Um, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about the police and fire department, for, for instance, lately, and talking about how policing has changed, how fire has changed, what that really means for everything. We just heard from Mary Rose. Um, I think we all know how health services changed, you know, for the last couple of years. But the, the function of a library's place in a community is really different now than it was 20 years ago. Um, it, is that an accurate statement, would you oh, say? Oh, yeah. No, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, you yeah. even talk about just the, the technology piece of things. Um, you know, you've, it used to just be, you, this is where you go to find your books. And now it's where you go to find a whole host of things. Yeah. And the things that you offer, I think, often surprise people because you just don't realize that you have them there. Um, but then you're also talking about a place where you provide services. You know, there's a, there's a part in here that's talking about seeking partnerships to develop and maintain relationships with local or local organizations, and you know, I know, um, you know, we've talked about um, homelessness here quite a bit, and and we know that libraries are often a point of contact for people who who don't have a, a place to go, um, and well, you know, it's where they are able to reach out through email, use the internet, um, have a place to stay for a little while during the day. I mean, there's a lot of different things that a library serves in that way, but then also youth um, services and, and all those kinds of things. And then I also noticed you talked about parking and the challenges there, which is obviously an issue that's on our plate. I mean, that's a, that is a challenge for the library if you think about the area that you're around there, but then also, um, and I already mentioned technology. So I, I think it could be helpful to hear a little bit more about that and how it intersects with the things that we're talking about here as a council, because I do think, um, and this is this is probably for you too, Mike, you know, to, to think about that in the future, but um, I do think it's important at, that we look at all the, f the possibilities that exist within the library as a building, but as an organization, um, and how it fits with everything else, uh, because I think it could potentially help you too in yeah. the work oh, that yeah. you're doing. I, I appreciate you saying all that, and, and uh, we'd be happy to yeah, do a work session or whatever makes the most sense. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. 
Okay. Well, I don't think I have any further questions, if anybody else does. Well, thank you very much for the presentation tonight. We really appreciate it. Have a great night. All right, you too. And next up then is the airport. So we'll let uh, Todd get set here and we'll take off. Ready to roll? I'm ready to roll. All right, then next up we have our airport. So All right, thanks Mr. Ahead. Mayor and uh, good evening City Council, Todd Dalsing, Dubuque Regional Airport. I'm gonna leave our mission statement up while I introduce our Dubuque Airport Commission. From left to right, we have Michael Phillips. He's the chair of our airport commission. Uh, Marianne Kurtz Weber, vice chair. Sue Clemenson, RJ Blocker, and of course, many of you know for many years, uh, Doug Brotherton is uh, on our on our commission as well. I forgot to look if there's anyone here to recognize. <clears throat> the uh, commission goals are to retain and increase commercial air service, expand corporate and general aviation services, increase visibility and awareness of airport services, maintain our existing facilities, expand facilities to attract new business and increase service level, increase and diversify our revenue streams. Our Dubuque Airport organization chart, these are four departments that provide service to our customers and keep our airport and uh, ours, all of our airport operating safe and secure 24-7, 365. Um, so under airport administration, there's Dan Claus, who's the assistant director who oversees the operations and maintenance department. Cheryl Sheldon is our airport accountant who's with us tonight, actually. Uh, those are both full-time uh, full equivalent positions. And Karen Spizak is our part-time marketing coordinator who you all know does a, an awesome job and, and more of a full-time equivalent. But uh, in our airport operations, Jesse, Chad, and Roger, um, they're all operations specialists that rotate a 24-hour shift. Um, their primary uh, um, duties are aircraft rescue, firefighting, and security, but they do a whole host of other things behind the scenes that people wouldn't see, keeping up our manuals, working with our FBO, uh, daily inspections, snow removal, all that fun stuff. Um, and they also uh, work with our airport maintenance. Uh, we've got uh, three full-time positions. Jason and Jeff are a mate category to uh, maintenance, airfield maintenance. Uh, Bob Moyer is our airfield mechanic and Connie Simon is our part-time custodial and she uh, maintains uh, primarily the uh, airport terminal and also some of the grounds. Um, and then under Dubuque Jet Center, uh, Adam Langbecker is our FBO supervisor and Tim Furlong is assistant FBO supervisor. Those are both full-time positions. Uh, the remaining are all part-time positions. Tina Herrig, Tina Malone are our uh, customer service representatives. And we have on the average around seven to 10 uh, part-time employees. And they are all uh, the folks that handle all the ground handling for the aircraft. Uh, creating an equi uh, equitable community of choice, Dubuque follows our airport equity plan, uh, resi resiliency, sustainability, equity, and compassion. We incorporate FAA disadvantaged business entrepreneurs and targeted small business plans into our airport projects. We utilize uh, electric ground handling equipment uh, we're upgrading, always upgrading our buildings. Um, most recently, we upgraded our airfield lighting to LED, uh, all to sustainable, obviously, technology. Our terminal building is Silver LEED certified, and, and you'll uh, talk about it in a minute, soon be powered by solar. We have multiple federal, state, local, legislative, business, and organization partnerships, and we continue to have a low full-time turnover rate and encourage the use of our city employee assistance program. Our fiscal year 23 highlights, as you can see on the board, relocate tax away alpha design, uh, also includes construction and construct solar photonic system. I just, I wanted to include this slide as a reminder that um, the airport has received three rounds of federal relief funding totaling just over $3.3 million. That can be used for debt service, uh, and operating costs to include the local match on our FAA uh, airport improvement program projects. 
Um, the federal uh, airport relief funds are, are going to be included in my presentation for FY24, and I'll call those out. And then the bill funds um, that uh, we received and or are applying to receive for are new this year. So the federal relief grant funds um, also reducing our airport tax asking. So I wanted to include this to show what our past, our current, and our, our future request is. So in FY21 and 22, our operating budget funds went towards debt service and equipment. This year in 23, our operating budget uh, uh, will be used for uh, debt service, equipment, and capital projects. And in FY24, um, the operating budget is we're requesting to be used towards debt service, equipment, and capital projects local match. Uh, reconstruct Taxiway Alpha, the preliminary design has been completed. Uh, this is a preliminary design for a multi-phase, multi-year estimated $26 million construction project to replace failing or failed taxiway pavement that has been uh, justified by the FAA required pavement maintenance program. Uh, this is an FAA AIP project of uh, just over $350,000. It was 90% federally funded at 316,000 uh, or just over, and our 10% local match of just over 35,000 came from our federal relief funds. Uh, Reconstruct Taxiway Alpha Phase Two. This project includes the site work, grading, uh, removal, and replacement of the Taxiway Alpha shown on the slide, and that's that green section. Uh, that goes on, up and on to the approach end of runway 18. Um, this project is scheduled to go out for bid spring of this year, 2023. This is again an FAA um, uh, project with an estimated total of just uh, around $3.1 million. It's going to be funded using 90% federal funds or just over $2.7 million. And our 10% local match of 310,000 will come from the federal relief funds. Construct solar system. Uh, this slide shows the location of a solar array that's going to be next to the terminal ring road to provide power to the terminal. Apologize, it didn't show up very well in this slide, but the solar uh, uh, system is in the blue there where my uh, cursor is. Um, and, and of course, that's the ring road, and it's going to power the terminal to the north of that picture. Um, the contract was awarded Eagle Point Solar. Uh, construction should begin uh, late 23, early 24, pending the availability of components and supply chain. Maquoketa Valley has said that this will be the largest solar system on their grid, which is kind of cool honors. Uh, again, this is an FAA project. Um, they're going through the FAA project process of just over $1.4 million. 95% of this is federally funded, uh, just over 1.3 million, and that's through that the BIL funds that I mentioned earlier. And the 5% local match of just over $70,000 is going to be paid for using our federal relief funds. Moving on to FY24, our requested operating budget uh, uh, summary, resources, property tax support, expenses, annual debt service. FY24 net property tax support and annual average homeowner's property tax costs. FY24, uh, we just have one recommended improvement uh, request, which has been recommended by the city manager, Van Milligan. Uh, it's for the addition, additional part-time line hours to provide ground handling service for a new carrier. Uh, master plan was adopted, uh, approved and adopted in 2021 and used as a guide for planning capital improvement projects. Um, I just wanted to include in this year's presentation as a reminder because it is a 541 page document that uh, we use to assist in guiding the airport over the next 20 years and it can be found on our website. And following the master plan recommendations, FY24 proposed capital improvement projects include uh, reconstruct Taxiway Alpha Phase 3, construct solar PV system Phase 2, and performing a, pra a, a pavement condition study. <clears throat> so the Rehabilitate Taxiway Alpha Construction Project Phase 3 is a continu the continuation of the multi-year project that I had mentioned. Uh, FY24 portions are highlighted on the blue uh, on our slide. So that would be the sections um, other than what we're working on completing this year. 
This is an FAA, uh, again, an FAA IP project estimated around 10, just over $10 million. 90% of that is gonna be federally funded um, at uh, just over 9 million, 10% local funding will come from a combination of uh, around 760,000 federal relief funds and around 276,000 city funds. Proposed phase two, construct solar fields. So we're working with the FAA and other federal or organizations to fund this project. Uh, the solar field would provide power to our snow removal equipment storage building, which is located here. And some of you all that have taken the tour, that's where we keep our large snow removal equipment. Um, our uh, joint use facility, which is located here. Uh, that's where our airport operations and maintenance folks are. And then of course our general aviation terminal, the Dubuque Jet Center. Um, another FAA project estimated at a, uh, just under $400,000. Again, 95% federally funded at 375 and 5% local match of just under 20,000 coming from our federal relief funds. So in FY24, we do have some new hangar construction and we're gonna diagram, looking at the diagram from left to right on your screen, um, hangar 84 is a new land leased with tenant constructing a hangar. Uh, hangar 93 is a proposed land lease with tenant constructing a hangar. And hangar 105 is an airport. Uh, we, the airport, are gonna construct the hangar using uh, the DOT Iowa Commercial Aviation Infrastructure Funds. It's a mouthful. ICAF is what they call it. Uh, and then we'll enter into an annual hangar lease agreement with the tenant. This is 100% state funded, 0% local dollars are going into this project, uh, just under $2.8 million. This is a one-time grant new this year from the governor's office using state ARPA funds um, that the Iowa Public Airport Associations were, uh, has been lobbying for. Performance measures, aviation fuel gallons sold over the past five years. The graph shows aviation jet fuel only. So this is jet A and, and 100 low lead. Blue column on the left equals gallons sold and the uh, green column on the right equals net profit. Uh, uh, based aircraft at Dubuque. Dubuque has 84 based aircraft in a variety of hangars. Uh, number and type are provided in the graph on the left and examples of the different types and sizes of aircraft are included in the slide. Um, I also wanted to compare that number with kind of like-size airports, Sioux City, uh, Waterloo, Dubuque, was what I would consider like-size airports. Um, Sioux City had, what, 64 based aircraft, Waterloo 770, Dubuque 84, and then I added Des Moines and Cedar Rapids, a little bit larger uh, airports, obviously, um, in general, but Des Moines had 105 and Cedar Rapids 128. Uh, Dubuque Aircraft Operations, and um, just for your, your knowledge and the viewers, an, air, an operation is def defined as a takeoff or a landing uh, of all aircraft. Doesn't matter if they're based in Dubuque or a transit. So the past two years, Dubuque, I was able to come to you and say that we were the busiest airport in Iowa. Uh, in 2022, Des Moines took that busiest airport honor. So um, Dubuque uh, still had 74,224, just a little bit of a dip from last year. Um, and then we also, I always like to compare with other airports. So you can see Des Moines at 85,000. Cedar Rapids had what, about just under, about half of ours at 44,000. And I like to include ORD, which is Chicago Hare, just to show uh, the number of operations that Chicago Hare has in a year compared to Dubuque and other Iowa airports. Staff continues to work with uh, our tenants to promote high quality airport services. Uh, Blue Skies over Dubuque provides aircraft maintenance to local and transient general aviation and commercial aircraft customers. Uh, University of Dubuque has over 300 students, instructors, and staff operating out of the Babka Flight Center and three of our um, existing corporate hangars. EAA, or Experimental Aircraft Association, has over 100 members, and they uh, lease hangar space as part of a partnership with the airport to help build general aviation awareness and education. Civil Air Patrol has over 400, uh, 440 members. Um, their mission is supporting America's communities with emergency response, diverse uh, aviation and ground services, youth development, which they do a fantastic job at Dubuque with that, 
uh, and promote of air, space, and cyber power. Uh, NICC partner, partnering with uh, UD, EAA, and the airport has provided an accredited avionics ma uh, maintenance program. And all of the above organizations volunteer during the wide variety of airport events that are uh, held throughout the year. Uh, partnerships are providing community outreach uh, at the airport through tours and gatherings. Uh, some of these pictures are from previous tours, but we continue to, uh, to host all that. I'd like to provide a commercial air service update for you. So the Chamber-led Air Service Task Force is a private public partnership comprised of Dubuque community and business leaders who meet monthly to review current trends and receive updates from the airport chamber and our uh, consultants. And there's a list of the uh, current members provided on that slide. The Air Service Task Force is to, a goal is to restore, sustain, and enhance air service. To achieve the goal, the task force has identified three objectives and strategies in really in no particular order, and some overlap each other in the work that's being done. Um, restore daily commercial air service to major hubs with connecting flights. Retain and expand commercial air service to leisure destinations. And support the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce Coalition, which I'll touch on. Objective one strategy to restore daily air service Revise our current small community air service development uh, grant program uh, application. So currently, uh, the DOT portion is $775,000. Uh, we're requesting $1.25 million, um, and that with our current local match from Travel Partners would bring the SCASD grant up to $2 million. So right now, we have $1.2 million that we can take to airlines and negotiate with, and we're hoping to increase that to $2 million. Uh, pursuing <clears throat> options to work with local private uh, public partnerships for additional funding that has worked in other communities to provide minimum revenue guarantees and also working with our Dubuque Airport consultant to maintain and build relations with legacy and regional carriers, attend air service conferences, meet one-on-one -on -one with airline representatives, and um, uh, go to uh, headquarters meetings. Objective two, strategy to expand weekly leisure air service. Dubuque currently operates uh, Sun Country 737, non-scheduled public charters providing service to Atlantic City, Biloxi, and Laughlin. The new Avalo service, after a delay of service, and Dubuque continues to work with TSA to approve our airport security program. Announcement coming soon regarding start of service. Avalo flies 737, uh, uh, offering weekly flights on Wednesday and Saturday to Orlando, Florida. A minimum revenue guarantee of $1 million, which thank, uh, thank you, city Mayor and City Council, for the $500,000 from the city. And, of course, the Board of Supervisors for $500,000. And airport incentives over two years were required to even just attract that service. The task force uh, will continue to discussions with existing and, and new ultra-low-cost carriers providing service to uh, uh, hopefully add destinations and, and frequency of existing. Objective three, the strategies uh, working with the Chamber Coalition. So number one, the National Awareness Coalition campaign, uh, thanks to a generous grant from the Dubuque Racing Association, the Chamber hired a consultant to nationally raise attention and pursue all options to restore air service. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that includes uh, meeting with airports with similar air service challenges as Dubuque and interest in participating in a coalition. Implement a national campaign with uh, launching with branding, logo, website, communications. Messaging regarding challenges for rural and regional airports as a national narrative that rural America is being left behind and disproportionately impacted by the pilot shortage. Number two, air service development, uh, fundraising campaign for future MRG. Explore similar success programs like Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, they have a program called CRAFT, or Cheyenne Regional Airport Focus Team, uh, that's been very successful um, with bringing air service back. And Montrose, Colorado, they're the Colorado Flight Alliance. Um, they also have a, a, a successful um, program going there. Uh, propose public-private partnerships, and as I mentioned, build our uh, local MRG funds to be used for air service development 
and that can be starting with our SCASD grant that's currently at 1.2 million that we're, we're, we're trying to grow to two. Um, and then another one is uh, Orlando Trade Mission. So working with our travel partners, connect with counterparts within the Orle uh, Orlando region to maximize support for Avalo's service from Orlando to Dubuque as a destination location. An example would be to bring Orlando Little League baseball teams and families to uh, stay and, and the Dubuque area and, and play at the Field of Dreams. Airport events that have occurred since our last budget presentation. So we had two uh, honor flights of Dubuque, uh, two flights over two days, uh, flew veterans and volunteers to DC to view the monuments and gather with fellow comrades. <clears throat> Excuse me, there are two additional honor flights scheduled for May of 23. Some additional events, we, we held the 5K run, run the Runways Awareness for Human Trafficking in April. Uh, our July 3rd air show aircraft viewing was held July 1st through the 4th. Um, and that's uh, scheduled to come back again this year, as well as the North American Trainers Association. That's the formation clinic of around anywhere from you know 60 to 70 plus aircraft and they stay for the full week and they stay in our hotels and eat at our restaurants and shop and get catering and buy fuel and produce operations and, and all that good stuff for our community. We had a beautiful day and great attendance at the Captain Robert Martin Terminal dedication held uh, July 19th. Included speakers, thank you, Mayor, one of the, the presenters at, at that celebration. Uh, chamber ribbon cutting, monument unveiling, and a T6 flyover. Uh, and actually, that T6 would have been something that Captain Martin would have trained in before he moved up to the uh, P-51 Mustang. Ceremon uh, ceremony include the dedication of the monument and relief. A um, couple examples shown there. Other items include uh, exterior pedestrian signage on the terminal building, educational material playing on our terminal monitors and display items. Uh, Captain Martin community and staff are planning a celebration for July of 23. MLB was back for a second year. We love having them, uh, featuring the Cubs and the Reds. Uh, Dubuque staff turned both team aircraft charters. The Reds had a 757, that's top pitcher left aircraft. Cubs had a 737, and two team 737 private charters on the terminal apron and the approach end of runway 31, which if you remember, we closed one runway uh, and, and just maintained the other for arrivals and departures. <clears throat> we had multiple corporate aircraft reservations, some dropping and going, some staying during the event. Uh, approximately 65 large corporate aircraft parked on the apron and closed runway, as I mentioned, and, and all airport employees and several volunteers worked very hard, uh, not only leading up to, but the day before, the day of, day after the game to make it a, a safe and efficient operation. Uh, this year was similar to last year, approximately 24,000 uh, gallons of fuel sold and, of course, associated ground handling fees generated revenue for the airport. Um, again, we received multiple compliments from crew and passengers who routinely fly into events like the Kentucky, Kentucky Derby and the uh, Masters golf outing. So hats off to the whole team. They did a fantastic job. And with that, uh, thank you. I encourage everyone to visit our website at flydbq.com for more information and happy to answer any questions you may have. All right. Well, thank you very much, Todd. Uh, first of all, do we have any comments from the public this evening on... Dubuque Regional Airport presentation. Seeing none in chambers, we have any virtual? No virtual input. All right. Back to the table then for any questions and discussion. All right. Awfully quiet. Yes. Well, Todd, um, it, it's, it's been a long year. We've had challenges. Um, the first thing I want to say to you is, you know, I get to see very often how hard you're working and you and your team and everybody who's working on this. I get to, I, I had the honor of being able to, to work with you on a lot of the challenges in front of us here. And um, I just want to commend you on everything that you've been doing. I mean, you know, I think this, this last, this last point you made here, I think is a really important one. When you talk about the field of dreams and the compliments that you get from people on the busiest day at the airport, clearly, you know, for, for what's really going on, um, you run an incredible airport. 
and you really do, and you have for a very long time. And people notice. And uh, you know, the, the folks that are flying out of there on a regular basis, you know, in and out, the UD program, um, everybody that you work with knows this. I think it's really important that, uh, first of all, the public knows that the airport's open, <laughs> open for business. Uh, we're, and the second thing is we're working very hard to return air service uh, that the, the full community can use. Mm -hmm. And we are not alone in this. Uh, I, I think that there, I hope that there's a good understanding in the public right now that this is not just Dubuque that is experiencing the challenges of the air service industry right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's become very clear to me on all the work that I get to join in on in doing this. Um, but uh, the challenges remain, and we, we need to continue working on it, and we absolutely will. Um, you and I know this is not our first meeting today. Um, <laughs> so, you know, these are things that we're, we're working on very hard. Um, you know, you gave, us a, you gave us a bit of an outline on things. Um, you know, I, I appreciate our media partners and Telegraph Herald and others keeping everybody up to date on what's going on. Um, you said there's an announcement coming about Avello and we'll be able to move forward with that very soon. But um, aside from that, the goal is return commercial air service to the Dubuque Regional Airport. Mm -hmm. and I, I think people are definitely losing sleep over that, meaning that we are not sleeping and we're getting this done. We're gonna, we're gonna find some way to make this happen, but it's a challenge in the market that we're in right now. It's a real challenge. Yes, it is. So I just wanna make sure everybody knows the, the work that Todd is doing, and, and um, not just Todd, but a lot of people are, are working very hard at this. But aside from that, you know, what you give us here shows that we have a, a highly high-functioning airport and I'm proud of the work that you're doing. So thank you very much for all of it. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right. Well, with that, we appreciate the presentation and appreciate you being here tonight. Okay. Thank you. All right. We will move on then to our next presentation, which is oh, right here. Oh, that's fine. The right. Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support. Oh, yeah, we're ready, to, ready go. to roll. Look at this. We don't even get a chance to like breathe. This is great. All right. Well, Anderson, take it away with the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support for us. Thank you, uh, Mayor and City Council members. Good afternoon. My name is Anderson Sansi, and I'm the Director of the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support. Uh, thank you for your guidance and your leadership. And of course, to the City Manager, thank you for your personal and professional uh, leadership and, and guidance. I want to start our presentation with a, a cool video, and hopefully this will work. I don't see anything on top of the screen. There we go. Oh, here we are. So we're here with the Downtown Neighborhood Association, and we're beautifying Jackson Park. Oh, we're just laying down some fresh mulch so that way the kids can have fun, be safe, and just really enjoy their time being here in the park. It's a free place for everybody to come to, and my grandkids will be here, and I was here when I was little, so yeah, yeah. as long as we can all help the community and make it beautiful for everybody. We would love to see this happen in other neighborhoods, so if you're interested in looking to beautify your neighborhood, please contact us over at the uh, Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support because we want to support you, we want to invest within your community, your neighborhood, and just uh, make the area just you know pop a little bit more. We're really excited with working with the neighbors around to make this thing happen. Let's beautify Dubuque. What a great video. So on, on May 20th, 2022, I sent an email to the president of the Downtown Neighborhood Association asking him if he was still interested in doing the beautification project. And so as I was going through our files and looking at existing efforts through Neighborhood Association, this was one of many projects that were going on. And when I sent the email, I got a response back that really touched my spirit. And the comment was, Anderson, because of the pandemic and because of old age, I'm no longer able to uplift uh, this initiative and organize it. 
And I remember responding back saying, there's a new sheriff in town. And that's not me, but that's the team behind me. And the reason why I responded to him like that is because I remember receiving a phone call from the city manager who made it very clear to me, Anderson, don't forget about the neighborhood associations. And so throughout the year, we have monthly touch points with active neighborhood associations. We also have quarterly meetings when we invite all of the neighborhood associations to not only connect with city staff, but also for them to hear about different initi initiatives and projects that are going on. So our mission is to work with both public and private partners to address, prevent, and reduce poverty. And it's not just for individuals, but it's also making sure that we have equitable opportunities for all residents and neighborhoods throughout the community. We recognize based on the plan that was put together that we have areas throughout the community where there's concentration of poverty. And we want to make sure that we're working with residents and the community to address those. Our approach to the work is very critical. And so what you see on the right hand side and for you on your left hand sides is the eight determinants of poverty that was identified of why people are experiencing uh, poverty. And I remember when I got the position, I recognized that I needed to create a framework with uh, different stakeholders. So that way when we go and talk to individuals, they recognize how we plan on moving the work collectively so the first thing that's very important is data always. Once we're able to identify the root causes and all of these determinants, we want to disaggregate data and we want to bring existing partners to the table to talk about how are we currently moving these problems forward and what are new ways uh, that we can begin to collectively work together to address these issues. We want to make sure that it's not just existing partners that are at the table, but we want to be active and connecting with new partners throughout the community to bring them to the table, especially those who are experiencing poverty every single day, because we're big believers that those who are closest to the problem have the solutions. And we have to be mindful to step aside at times and empower them to make those decisions or work collectively. And we also want to make sure we're investing in efforts that's going to solve poverty. And two ways that we do that is, number one, through neighborhood associations. We want to make sure that neighborhood associations recognize that there are small grants to address their community needs. Uh, we also, through City Life, we try to invest in catering, and specifically small businesses, women, and racial minorities. So we're not a social work program. We're a group that's focusing on addressing the system. So what does that mean? Our focus is on understanding how all people are affected by various systems, such as housing, education, health, and other determinants that you see on the slide. We seek to partner with the community to identify the root causes, then bring data to the table. So I want to give some examples of things that we've been able to accomplish, kind of high level, and then bring it back down to the local level. So I've had the privilege of attending a national conference with the CEO of the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque and also the Q Casino to talk about equitable grant making. And so why is equitable grant making so important? As you look at research, typically how funding is being deployed throughout the state or local communities, it starts off with trust and relationships. Just think about it. If you go to the bank, you're probably more likely to get a grant or a loan because you have an active relationship with the banker and trust. And typically, who's left out of those equations or those relationships? Our most vulnerable community members. And so we want to make sure that when we're thinking about deploying grants or resources, we are keeping the most vulnerable in mind at all times. At the state level, uh, I've had the privilege of uh, joining a conversation where Council Member Ms. Farber was talking about small businesses. And as she was talking, someone else on the panel stood up and said, you know what, because of the pandemic, I've been able to work with legislators and our state governor to deploy large capital to businesses who were shut down because of the pandemic. And I remember raising my hand and I said, wow, that's, that's real nice. What percentage of that funding went to women and racial minorities? It went silent. They didn't have an answer. So at times, it's asking the tough 
questions to make sure that truly if we want to make Iowa a great place for everyone or Dubuque a great place for everyone, we have to center the most vulnerable. And as a result, I don't know if it was because of Ms. Farber, but that week I got a call to join the state committee. And so now I'm uh, across the state of Iowa. I get to participate in conversations focused on minority unemployment and outreach to community members as well to also make sure how are we providing suggestions to the governor to skill people up. So that's, that's pretty cool. I also have the privilege, monthly and quarterly, I get the opportunity to connect with a variety of partners uh, in those determinants to talk about not only the data that they're utilizing to move the community forward, but what are the ways the city can better collaborate and work with them. Earlier, we heard about Crescent Community Health Center, and I want to highlight them as well. We meet with them quarterly. They are data rich, and we love uh, meeting with Gary and his team and trying to figure out how do we continue to work together to address health inequities in our community. And I do want to highlight to the mayor and city council earlier on this year, you did a letter of proposal or support actually uh, to make sure that Crescent community was able to get a community health worker. So this is their third one that they have. They have one to address health inequities for Hispanics, one for Marshallese, and also now one for African American communities. So as we meet with them, we want to continue to know what's working with those uh, staffs and how, again, can the city continue to work with them? Because I believe the grant is only there for two years. So if we are seeing success, how can we put some of our resources behind them so that way they can continue to address health inequities? We're excited that tomorrow, I do want to give a shout out to Green State. We are working with them on home ownership. And so they'll be at the Multicultural Family Center talking with residents on how to repair their credits and build their credits to one day, hopefully, to purchase a home. Last year when I came and I talked about staff level, it was just myself and, and Tim Waugh, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, announce that we are uh, fully staffed. We have a total of 3.66 full-time. And here's the leaders. And I, I gotta say this, I know you'll hear this from all the department heads, but I work with the best staff ever. They are truly amazing. It's not often that you won't see us together in the community uh, trying to solve community issues. And so I'm truly thankful for them. And if you don't mind me in embarrassing them right now for a little bit, I want to go through each and every single one of them. Um, first of all, our administrative assistant, Ms. Liz, more than an administrative assistant. Uh, she's responsible for day-to-day -day operation support, developing our department, uh, SOPs, trainings. She's focusing on grace, grants for all the neighborhood association, co-lead city life. Uh, one of the most exciting things about Liz on her first week, first week, uh, she got a call from Head Start. We're now in the uh, old, old engine house. She got a call from Head Start and they said, hey, our trash wasn't picked up. Uh, for some reason, she knew a little bit about trash, probably because the guy that works with her used to manage the trash. But she was able to not only address the trash issues, they had to put the trash out, but she walked from City Hall all the way down to Head Start to take the trash out for them and the recycling. You may not think that's a big deal, but this is her first week. I didn't tell her to do it. She's one who's not going to push any customer to the side. She's going to figure out how to address it. So thankful for Liz. Tim Wall Perry, uh, also known as the Rising Star. Uh, very excited to have him on the team and also dancing with the star. You guys saw him do the backflip. You know, once you get my age, you can't do that anymore. But an amazing person. He's responsible for two things for council. Uh, he's responsible for engaging residents into their local government, so making sure people understand how their government functions, and then getting them excited about joining boards, commissions, and our neighborhood associations. As you look at the Equitable Poverty Prevention Plan, it's not just making sure people have the financial resources they need, but also the social and political power to address their community needs. Again, powering residents to address their issues. So we're so thankful for Tim Watt. Brian Moose is our newest member, AKA uh, Big B. We're so thankful for B. He's responsible for updating our equitable poverty prevention plan, the data. He's responsible for identifying what is a livable wage for the residents of Dubuque and hopefully bringing that to you so you can understand what people need in order to survive. He's working with uh, the community health needs assessment. He's also working on identifying how can we as an organization be more data focused, 
outcome driven. So what does that look like? It's called identifying and creating a data governance policy where as an organization we'll be able to identify how can we collectively pull data, share data, and move programs and initiatives forward. And kind of in my world, what I'm hoping with that data governance policy, not only internally, but as a community, Mayor Kavanaugh, as you talked about, how do we utilize that data, not only to move the city of Dubuque forward, but also to address inequities in our communities, collectively um, as a community. So the city, the schools, all of our community partners, and so he's currently right now working also with some community partners to figure out if we can come up with some MOUs where we all agree upon here are the data points that we're going to collectively focus on. So I'm so thankful for uh, Brian and the entire team. So how are we working to make Dubuque an equitable community of choice? As many of you know, this is dear to my heart and something that I strive to do every single day and everything that I do, every board or commission that I serve on. And so as we recognize poverty impacts many people in Dubuque, but it disproportionately it affects black and brown community members. So our focus has been on to utilize a racial equity lens to make sure that we're looking at the data and we're looking for ways to improve local and state policies collectively with the community members. So we won't shy away from the tough conversations. Um, we will walk together with our community members to address it. So let's look at poverty. Um, so here's what the data has shown us as of 2021, the most updated census. Uh, in 2017, Dubuque was at 16.3, but currently right now it's at 12.3. And what we believe is that the pandemic aid has helped cut poverty uh, in half. And so we have to continue to monitor uh, the data to see what happens next year. Uh, we also believe that although we're seeing poverty decrease, there was an amazing article by the TH uh, done a few weeks ago that says there's still many organizations who are not seeing any changes with the people that they're serving. And so we recognize that there's people who may not fit the official poverty level threshold um, that are above it, maybe by a few dollars, that are still struggling to make ends meet. And again, once we're able to bring you what uh, a livable wage is in the community, we'll be able to look at the data and see, okay, this is what people need in order to survive in our community. So yes, it may be good that we're seeing poverty is going down, but we still have a lot of work to do uh, collectively. As I mentioned earlier, poverty impacts different groups uh, differently. We are seeing that uh, there has been some improvement and majority of all of the groups. Um, but again, we know there's a lot of more work to do to engage these communities to be a part of the solution. When we compare ourselves with the other communities, uh, we see that Dubuque is at 12.3. Uh, average without Dubuque is 21.4. Uh, Some of the highlights last year when I came up to you, I said, hey, here are the things that we're gonna accomplish. We're gonna partner with community organizations to provide opportunities for residents for upward mobility. This could be through working with NICCs and Opportunity Dubuque to make sure that there's strategies to engage uh, targeted residents so that way they know the different career paths that are available so that way they can get a good paying job. We're doing that. We said we would hire data analysts. We did that. We talked about increasing residents' engagement into the city government process, which is engaging people through city life. You'll hear about that later on and see that we are starting to see more people participate in city life. We said we wanted to move into the old engine house because we couldn't afford rent in conference room B anymore. We did that. And we're currently still developing key metrics to address, prevent, and reduce poverty. And that's really just updating the, the data that we have uh, and making sure that everyone has access to that and we are working collectively to address it. And so poverty is just not a single department's focus. We're working with all of our city departments to address it, but we're also working with a variety of community members and it's very important for me to highlight what community members are doing to address poverty. I talked about Green State, talked about Crescent Community, but I also want to talk about the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque and the TH. One of the promising practice that was called out through our plan was to do the community equity profile. And currently, uh, they are working on the community equity profile to address various uh, topics. And 
this, these are topics that are impacting individuals every single day. And all of our staff members, when we got the call to be able to be trained on the facilitation um, to host community conversations, we jumped on board because we wanted to put our money where our mouth was. And so on the right was when we participated at John Deere, a conversation focused on health and wellness. So once a month, we do help design uh, the topic, uh, the people who are going to be on the panel. Super excited. As I talked about investments, uh, even these partners are investing into small businesses, particularly women and racial minorities. If you ever attended one of the community conversations, and if you look at some of their caterings, very intentional, focusing on women and racial minority-owned uh, businesses. So we're so thankful that these partners are jumping along uh, with us, because it will take a community to address these issues. I want to highlight the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. And this is an opportunity to put more money back into hardworking uh, people's pocket. And so this program was in existence before we got here. Um, and it was between uh, HACAP and the AARP, which is the American Association of Retired People. So a group of volunteers who came together and said, you know what, we want to make sure we're helping those who qualify uh, file their taxes. But after the pandemic, it began to slow down. We eventually heard about the program, and nationally, as we tend different conversations uh, through the Economic Mobility Network, they mentioned, hey, communities should really look at the VITA program and see how local governments can support and um, enhance it. And so when I figured out who some of the partners were, our team right away, we scheduled meetings with all of them to facilitate uh, the conversation. What worked well? What didn't work well? How could we improve it? And one of the things that was mentioned was we needed to get equipment, technology, computers, printers, internet access, because one of the previous partners uh, was no longer able to provide that. And because of relationships, we were able to work with our county partners and the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque to assist with those technologies. So simple things, understanding where the gaps are, and through our relationships, trying to figure out who can meet those needs. In the future, I think there's a huge opportunity to uh, expand on this service, finding new volunteers. We've tried to reach out to a variety of our colleges, both at University of Dubuque and Loris and some of uh, the private partners who are in this space to see if they could assist, because we do need numbers and able to support not only in-person uh, services that they provide, but they also had a drop-off. And we wanted to target some nights where we were focusing on those who are non uh, English speakers, where we could support them um, and also see what else uh, needs that they have in the community. Do you need a job? Do you need access to anything else? Uh, but we didn't have uh, the volunteers uh, to be able to do that. So I'm looking forward to hopefully next year, uh, with the right support from the community, we can um, extend and enhance. And as I mentioned earlier, being a part of a group called the Economic Mobility Network, no one else is doing that using equity as a, as a way to support residents. And when I mentioned it, it's something Dubuque wanted to do, uh, they wanted to know, how are you guys doing that? And again, it's because of the people behind me who are constantly meeting with various residents and community members and figuring out how to best service them. Talked earlier about moving into the old engine house. We are super excited. Uh, we've been uh, dreaming of this place for a while. Not that we didn't like Conference Room B, um, but we needed our own space uh, to be able to be creative. And so being able to go in and out the space with very community members and sharing the vision of what we dreamed it to be. And we want this place to be a place where community members can come in, they're able to address problems that are impacting them, they're able to get data from Brian, good process on how to solve those issues, and allowing them to do what's best uh, every single day. Now, here's what the space looks like, exactly what we dreamed it to be. Uh, a creative space where people can come in, utilize a small conference room space, uh, get some good data, and find a good process to address their community needs. We're excited that we also are on the top floor, and on the bottom is HACAP, and so our new neighbors. We actually scheduled a meeting with them a few days ago and had some great conversations on how they can better utilize this space. And I'll tell you a story. Uh, we walked in one day as we continued to tour uh, the building, and I saw a, a teacher and a student doing an assessment on the ground. And I remember looking at the team, and I just said, when we get our space, that would never happen again. 
Never. And so now, their conference room space, whenever they want to do an assessment, whenever they want to meet with parents, it's in their new conference room. And we want other community members to be able to utilize that space. And we're hoping to have a grand opening where neighborhood associations and community partners and the businesses on Central Corridor, when they have their meetings, this is their community space to utilize. And so now I'm excited uh, to bring uh, the rising star, uh, Tim Wong, is he right now? <laughs> to come say a few words as well. <laughs> thank you, Anderson. Um, and thank you, uh, City Council. Thank you, Mayor Cavanaugh. And thank you, City Manager Mike Van Milligan, uh, for this opportunity. Gosh, I got to figure out a way to embarrass you back. Um, <laughs> But what I want to talk to you about is uh, how we engage within the community. And um, so this phrase is included within the Dubuque's 2037 vision uh, statement. And so this was your vision, you know, and it drives our work every single day. And so here's just a few examples of how we engage within the community. And that's by promoting active participation in local governance, engaging neighborhoods to build community, and intentionally connecting with our diverse community members. Now, I'm excited to share some work that we've done and th uh, through that, through City Life. Now, City Life is a fun and interactive opportunity for uh, 25 community members to meet with 18 various uh, city departments to uh, connect with them and learn about how do they function, uh, ask direct questions, connect with other uh, community members, and also take tour, uh, tours of uh, six different facilities as well. And what's really cool is we're very intentional also about involving local small businesses within this experience as well. And so in order to execute such a great program, it takes a lot of planning. And so Liz and I meet and discuss uh, as far as current local events, uh, city council goals and priorities to determine as far as the 18 departments that we're going to have within the uh, program. We also reserve the facilities because this is uh, after hours and includes the tours. We identify and invest in minority women and dis disability business enterprises for catering. And also to design marketing strategies to reach diverse communities, but also sticking to the grassroots approach. Throughout each session, we encourage and empower residents to get involved with the city boards and commissions and also their neighborhood associations. And we do this because we want residents to feel empowered. We want them to uh, feel empowered to solve issues that impact their community. And also, we believe that those who are, again, like what Anderson mentioned, we believe that those who are closest to the problem have the solutions. And thanks to the success of our City Life program, Liz and I have accepted to present at the International Association for Public Participation Conference in May. And so the IAP2 is an uh, international organization that leads, advocates, and uh, advances uh, different methods for best practices in public participation. And so for the theme for this year, uh, it's for meeting residents where they're at. And so as Anderson mentioned, data is very important uh, in the work that we do. And so on the left side, you can see that our participation has uh, increased uh, over the years, right? And so this is due to us, I gotta give a special thank you over to the Public Information Office because they uh, meet with us and strategize on how we can actually market the program and have targeted outreach uh, so that way we can reach a diverse uh, group of residents. The data on the right uh, captures frequent words that residents uh, kind of give back for after our pre and post surveys. So this is from our uh, post surveys. And what caught my attention is words like great, loved, learning, and community. And I tell you, this does not happen without our 18 departments being involved and dedicating that time and investing within our residents. I also have to uh, add a selfish plug. Uh, one of the things that we also noticed, uh, the words Liz and Temwa. We put a lot of time and uh, energy into this program to make sure that it's not only uh, great for our residents, but also great for our city staff to have a quality experience. And so the other selfish plug that I have to put is that we have City Life uh, actually open right now. And so the application process started last week, Monday, and we're already at 10 applicants. Um, I was almost going to do a little dance right now, but we'll wait till uh, the end. 
And so just super excited for anybody that's tuned in right now that you can actually uh, sign up over at www.cityofdubuque.org backslash city life. So we'd love to have you and we'd love to see you. We have great music, uh, we have great food, and uh, great information and opportunity for you to get engaged. So it's not only uh, important that we engage our residents, but also our young adult residents, right? And so one of the things that we've done is uh, we've been collaborating and working together with the IJAG program over within our senior, uh, senior high school and Hempstead High School. IJAG, so JAG stands for Jobs for Americans Graduates, and so the I is for Iowa, which is the chapter. And so the students also still meet with 18 uh, city departments. They get to ask questions. They also take tours. Um, now, the awesome part, what they also get to do is they get to take some selfies that they get to upload on their social media, all right? A lot of them are trending at this time. Uh, so we also had a focus that they mentioned to us that they wanted to focus on equity. And so we met with our, city, uh, with our different departments to infuse it, that, to mention what it is that we do in each department in our work. And so uh, in that, I remember one of the students, because uh, when each department is presenting, they share a little background about themselves and how they got to the position that they're at. This is intentional to reduce the barriers and, and uh, the other thought process of how can they actually interact and connect with their local government. And so one of the students approached one of our departments and mentioned that as they were listening to the story, they felt that they really connected with it because they were lost of where they thought they were at and where they wanted to go. But with seeing how the city uh, department staff accomplished and overcame barriers and got to where they're at, they were inspired and they were hopeful for their own future because they saw themselves in, in that uh, staff. So really excited about that. And I also got to make a shout out and a special thank you to uh, Mayor Kavanaugh for jumpstarting the program. A lot of students who are very excited about that. And it's great to hear that, you know, hey, I got to meet the, uh, the mayor. You know, they got, started chatting about that with their friends and their family, so. We want City Life to be a program uh, that is accessible and equitable to all of our residents. And one of the ways that we've done that uh, is by in including interpretive services within our program. And so this is for non-speaking residents, so that way that they can be able to also engage within uh, the program. We've worked closely with the, the Public Information Office to redesign our brochure, where now it includes Spanish and Marshallese translations. And so in the photo to the left, at the bottom left, you can see uh, our, our interpreters meeting and, and talking with uh, one of our resident participants and their daughter and translating the program for them. So again, investing within our local and minority owned businesses is very important to us. And one of the cool things that the residents also mentioned about the experience that they had is they didn't know that some of these local businesses were around. And because they had the opportunity to actually try their food, they now are, are, they frequent there quite often. And so we're really excited about that. And what's been great is uh, as we've been going through the program, we've, we're not only just uh, promoting the program, but promoting the local businesses to other uh, city departments, other uh, local organizations as well, to, uh, to look at this list, to, to look at what they offer, and to be able to include that within their programs and events. Now, one of the, uh, Anderson mentioned this earlier, and this is very near and dear for all of us, is we uh, had the comment from the city manager not to forget uh, the neighborhoods. And that's important to us because we never want to do that. And so monthly we attend neighborhood association meetings to, to listen to our neighbors and uh, to hear what's kind of going on within the community and how can we work together. Quarterly we invite the neighborhood associations to uh, listen in and as the city departments provide updates and for them to also kind of share some of the things that are going on within their neighborhoods so that way, again, we can work together to find some solutions. And so ways that we invest in our neighborhoods is through our small grants. And as you can see over the year, uh, it's been great to see that number increase because there's a lot of activities going on and a lot of excitement going on for residents to be uh, involved within their neighborhoods to make a difference, right? To be the difference that they want to see. 
And so I'd like to ha highlight some of the neighborhoods that uh, meet either monthly or as needed in order to build community. So our Point Neighborhood Association, they meet uh, every first Tuesday, so they'll be meeting next week on Tuesday uh, at 6.30 p.m. And so a couple of, a few of the projects that they've uh, completed is the National Night Out, the Hot Dog Night, which you saw in the previous slide, uh, the Holiday Care Baskets for Sunny Crest, and their annual Christmas social. The North End, and, uh, North End Association meets every first Wednesday, so they'll be meeting this Wednesday at 6.30. And some of the uh, projects that they've completed is the Christmas Social. And I, I want to talk a little more about the second one, the annual North End Community Picnic and Career Fair. What's, what's really cool about this project, excuse me, is uh, we work closely with Clower Manufacturing. So last year, Clower Manufacturing uh, reached out to our department and they wanted to get more involved within the North End. And through that, uh, they invited us to over to take a tour of their facility to learn about uh, their business and jobs that were available. And so the idea came for creating a community picnic and job fair so that way they can reach out to their neighbors and uh, let them know, hey, we are here, you know, and we're invested within our community and we want to be able to provide uh, different opportunities and to interact with their neighbors. And so what was really cool is I want to read this quote. Ulti ultimately, I think this is turning out to be a great way for us to get involved, give back to the community, as well as providing opportunities for jobs to some who may not know what options are available. And this is from the HR manager, Megan Palin. How cool is that? For businesses to get involved within their neighborhoods and to connect with their residents. And what was great, it was Clower Manufacturing also invited other local businesses to participate in this picnic. And it was cool to see uh, a lot of the kids came in and they were enjoying a few of the games that were going on and the food that was being provided. But they left and we're like, okay, where did they go? And they came back with more friends and more family members and say, hey, here, here's some opportunities that are being offered here. So that's really just great, again, of the excitement that could be generated within each neighborhood. So because of the success of that uh, event, Clower is looking to offer that, uh, to do this picnic two more times, uh, twice a year. Two more times, sorry. I want to highlight uh, Lang the Langworthy District Neighborhood Association as well. And some of the, uh, the projects that they completed last year was a neighborhood picnic. What was really cool about this event uh, was not only just seeing all the community members coming together, but how many generations were there. Uh, as you can see, kind of like at the back left, maybe back right of your picture, the kids just playing and interacting and having fun. Uh, I saw some teens coming in with their friends and they're like, hey, you know, I've got some free food because teens love food. Um, but what was also really cool was seeing that the local talent that was within their neighborhood performing live there, right? So it's, it's great to see as far as those members giving their gifts, giving their talent as well to their, uh, their, to their neighborhood. And then the Downtown Neighborhood Association. Um, recently, again, as you saw, we had the beautification of Jackson Park. And I got to mention, that was a lot of mulch. That was a lot of mulch. <laughs> I got to say, I probably burned uh, 50,000 calories or something. I don't know, but uh, toned up a little bit as well along the process. But this was a great experience uh, for the neighborhood. Uh, what was great is we did market this through social media and other aspects. but. What was cool was the word of mouth. Uh, we asked the kids, hey, how did you hear about this? Because I'm assuming none of them were on Facebook. Maybe they were. But they were like, hey, somebody mentioned this. And we went out and we started talking to our friends and say, because they wanted to make a difference within their park and it's something that's memorable for them. But as you saw also, um, Amanda sharing her story of how she used to play within the park, but now brought her, uh, her kids over to be able to experience the same thing. And that's just a beautiful impact that our associations have uh, within just the lives of uh, their neighbors, because you have individuals that are passionate about where they live at and opportunities to be able to give back. And so with that, I'm going to turn that back over. Thank you, Tim Waugh. And I do want to thank the Leisure Service Department and the Parks Department for providing all of the mulch uh, that was uh, spread out by the community members. So we're thankful for the partnerships that we have with a variety of city departments. 
And so future initiatives, what I want to come back to you next year and say we accomplish. Uh, first of all, a City Life program offered in Spanish. You see that we're currently offering it at least three times a year. Uh, once in the fall, once in the spring, we're trying to engage our youth, but we recognize that there's a growing population of residents that uh, may not speak English. And so currently right now, uh, our team is working with city departments to identify, do you have any Spanish-speaking staff that can help co-design what city life in Spanish looks like? And also meeting with residents in the community, those who participate in city life and those that we have relationships with to say, hey, can you help us uh, create this? And so we would love to offer this in Spanish to our, our residents and continue to look for different ways to engage residents again into the local governance process because when we do that, we empower them, get them involved in boards and commission. We truly can move the city towards this idea of being an equitable community of choice. We want to continue to partner with community members to implement the poverty prevention and, and reduction plan. We want to create a neighborhood association toolkit as residents throughout the community, if you're interested in starting a, a neighborhood association with residents in your community, however you identify that, you can reach out to our department and we have some steps to, to walk you through that to get you excited about the assets that are in the community and not just the deficits. Let's just focus on problems. No, let's also focus on the things that are working well in the community and engage residents around that. We want to establish a data governance policy, as I mentioned earlier, just having a good framework on how we collect, analyze, share data internally, but also externally, so that way we can move the community uh, forward. And as you mentioned, the, the, the next one is not only internally, but also working with our community partners. Uh, Brian meets with a variety of community partners uh, to, one, build re relationships, authentic relationships, and begin to identify what are some of the metrics you are uh, working on or focused on, and trying to connect that back to our poverty prevention plan. Uh, we want to continue to increase the number of associations, active associations, throughout the community where people are excited about building community within their neighborhoods. I think that's critical. Uh, we're big believers to do with and never for. Uh, in our community. And eventually we want to bring to you uh, what is a livable wage in a community? What do people need in Dubuque in order to survive? Right? There's a survival budget and there's also a stability budget, but how are we using that data uh, to make sure as we support programs like Opportunity Dubuque, it is programs that are skilling people up into good paying jobs. And so uh, this is what it costs the average homeowner, $6.36, and uh, the net operating property tax is $440,000, and I would be more than willing to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Anderson and Temwa, and uh, Brian and Liz, Liz, I can see you back there, too. Thank you very much for being here. So first of all, do we have any community input this evening? Yeah, Abhishek? Yeah. N name and address, too, make sure. Okay. So this is Abhishek Rai, uh, 3674 Pennsylvania Avenue. So this is more of an input from an insider, so uh, inside the city of Dubuque organization. Uh, one of the things I think uh, Anderson and Temba do very well is reaching out to new minority employees in the organization and invite them to talks. And this is more of an informal few times a year about how we can develop your professional skills and make them feel welcome. And I just wanted to highlight that. And uh, also, we have been doing, working on figuring out a group policy. So it, it's not limited to uh, minority employees, but also employees which are from other protected class, like LGBT community and other protected classes. So this is not something quantifiable, but I think it plays out a big uh, role in retention of minority employees, and I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. Any other comments in here? Seeing none, do we have any virtual comments? No virtual input. All right. Back to the table, then. Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Anderson, and of course, Tim Wah and Liz, for all that you guys are doing in our neighborhood. I kind of have an unusual arrangement where I get to see you guys twice a month um, at, my, at two of my neighborhood associations. So I know you are trying to do a lot. Um, and when we started your, your department, we knew it needed some water and some growth. And it seems like you are growing. And 
I'm hoping we can eventually figure out a way to keep watering you and keep watching your young department flourish. So thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. So speaking of watering, uh, I want you to know that as a youngster, I also played in Jackson Park. Hmm. Uh, and it looked a little bit different then than it does now. So the upgrade is just absolutely gorgeous. I have been there since. So thank you for that. Um, wanted to talk about the relationship you have with the community partners, and I think the Clower example was one that was very notable for workforce. But you also mentioned NICC uh, and some of the programs that they have, or certificate programs, or perhaps the Earn to Learn programs. And I do know that some of the nonprofit boards that I sit on, Finley Hospital in particular, and other hospitals, I'm sure, in Dubuque, um, are always looking for um, resources uh, through those certificate programs um, that are offered at NICC and maybe the IJAG as well um, and some others. Is that something that you guys are connected with in terms of your outreach that you had mentioned? Uh, yes, Council Member Farber. So we meet, I believe, quarterly with NICC and currently right now what we have been working on is uh, identifying community connectors uh, in the community who are in specific communities, let's just say, hey, uh, if you're in the African American community, who are the influencers that we can tap into to get them to promote some of Opportunity Dubuque's? Similar, who's in the uh, Hispanic, who's in the Marshallese, and how do we empower residents to walk inside NICC to get some of those uh, skill developments to get those good paying jobs? So yes, we are meeting with them. Okay, because I know in the healthcare area, um, as well as um, funding from UD and Finley, and I think Mercy as well is very involved. Um, that might just, that's such a key area um, as an example of the need here within the city for uh, public safety and health. Um, and I know that that's a good stepping stone uh, for folks. I would be happy to share any additional information with you on behalf of those groups if that's of need, but I know that NICC does have certificate programs as well. Yes, ma'am. Anything we can do to continue to bridge those gaps, we're willing. I just think that would be great, and your, your, um, your funnel to those uh, individuals, I think, is outstanding. Your, your um, whole presentation was just very uplifting and brought a smile to my face because you guys have smiles on your face uh, knowing that you're enjoying what you're doing and you're stepping up. And I think that um, the watering has been done. I think there's a lot of shoots out there. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wethel, I'll check in with you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I just want to say uh, my background in healthcare is that we move forward with data. Uh, we make decisions based on data. And the fact that your office has become and been able to be so data driven and your efforts are 100% there. I just really appreciate that. Um, I think being able to quantitatively measure these outcomes, we know that qualitatively you do so much and have, but I think it's great to be able to measure them in this way. So thank you for your presentation and for all the work you all do. Well, thank you so much. Again, you guys know this first starts off with mayor and council uh, identifying that it's a priority and. Um, amazing city manager who kind of tells us we have to do that and we have a variety of departments who are looking to utilize data every single day more effectively and so it's it's a community effort right there yeah Ms. Roussel. thank you uh, Anderson and Temwa it's always so exciting to hear you speak and talk of the great work that you're doing and it's it's exciting to me to see this office becoming what we um, what we envisioned it to be a connector hub, that there's so much good going on in our community, but to have a place where people can come and connect and, and just make that good work explode into even, even more. And to make sure that the people in our community can go have somewhere now that they can go and make connections to all that good work that's already being done. So, so thank you for that. And I enjoyed um, some of the um, some of the wisdom that you shared. Like those that are closest to the problem have the solutions. But I also like something you added at the end that was do do with someone, not for someone. And that's so important. It's so empowering. And and thank you for the work that you're doing. I just can't wait to see what you're going to bring us next year. Thank you so thank much. You. 
Well, one of the things that I like to go off of what Ms. Roussel just said is that you, you told us what you're going to bring us next year. I mean, you've got your future initiatives, and when you talked about what you brought this year and what you had discussed with us last year, I mean, you, you reached those goals. You know, one of the things that excites me the most about this new department that has been created is just how you have, I mean, you have just, you dove in. I mean, absolutely dove headfirst into the community and into the work that you do. Um, Mr. Sprank says that he has scheduled meetings with you twice a month. I mean, I see you at least twice a month in an unscheduled format. I mean, I just run into you everywhere because you're doing so much in the community. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about the, the future initiatives that you've, that you've put down here. Um, you know, one of the things that's, uh, that's really true, and I think this needs to be said, when you create a new department within city government, I think especially today, uh, because of the political environment that we're in, which generally sort of tends toward shrinking government, uh, it, it is difficult, I think, to justify sometimes. You have to be able to say, we're doing this because, and this is what we're getting out of this. What I would say, given your presentation, is that you are definitely pointing us in the direction of telling the whole community exactly what it is this is doing and why, and why this, this entire program exists in the first place, why this entire department exists in the first place. I'm especially, and I mean, you know this from what we've talked about before as we've talked about this department, but I'm especially excited about um, the, the data-driven components of what, you're, what you've discussed here. Uh, you've got a community data hub with external partners. It was one of my questions that I wrote down and you answered throughout your presentation is who else are you working with? You know, the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque, um, you mentioned Crescent Community Health Center. You, um, I'm thinking United Way, you know, and the Alice measurements as you talk about what a living wage really is. You know, all those different partners are people that you're already meeting with. Um, Ms. Farber suggests you meet with NICC, you tell us you're doing it quarterly already. I mean, these are things that are already happening, and I think that's really important that people know that. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, establishing the, uh, the data governance policy and then continuing to work through implementing this um, equitable poverty prevention and reduction plan, which really is just the master plan for what you're trying to do. And I appreciate the focus that you're, that you're having on that and the focus that you're having on um, bringing people to the table who don't often, who haven't traditionally had a seat at the table. I think it's really important that if, as we build a full and equitable community that that work is done very strategically and purposely and I think that you're absolutely doing that. So, so thank you for it. The, the suggestion I would have as you move forward, being a new department, is um, in any way that you can, measure everything. Measure everything, you know, I mean, um, one of the comments was, and I'm, I can't remember who said it tonight, but um, you know, this idea of some things are, are difficult to measure. You can't, um, you know, the, the qualitative stuff is, is not entirely measurable. I'm a believer that everything is measurable as long as you're asking the right questions uh -huh. and you're able to, to make sure that you get the, the data that can show us something. So, um, you know, for example, our poverty rates declining is the only reason because the federal government gave people extra money for a couple of years or is there anything that we're doing specifically in the city of Dubuque? Because as that money continue, or dries up from the federal government or you know, a state decides not to give any more money, what are we doing that can affect that, that, uh, that poverty rate? What are we doing that can affect people's um, you know, employment rate, median income, home ownership, all those things? I, th I think those are really important data points and partnering with the other folks in the community is I think a really important way to do that. But, um, I guess that's just a suggestion as you think about going forward. Um, whatever you do, measure it just to see what you get and make sure that you're, you're gathering that information that then we can show the community and say, um, yeah, this is, you know, we have, we have all this information that we can share and work with in the city of Dubuque government, but then also outside of it as a community, so. We truly appreciate yeah. it, thank you. Yeah. I said a lot there, I hope I made no, we some did. sense. No, we, we got people writing notes. Good, all right, perfect, <laughs> yes. Yeah, everybody's taking notes, perfect. All right. Well, thank you again for the presentation. We appreciate you being here. And uh, with, with that, we'll move on to our next one. I think at this point we'll take about a, let's take a three minute break, give or take, um, so we can kind of slowly transition to the next one and then we will start up again. We have returned. So I say we get a move on. So next up we have uh, the Office of Equity and Human Rights. And 
I, I would like to welcome Gisela to the stage. Hello. Should we wait? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for ha having me. So we'll get right started. This is the fiscal year 2024 budget presentation for um, the Equity and Human Rights Department. So we'll start off with the mission statement from the Office of Equity and Human Rights, which is to advance social justice, racial equity, and human rights in city services and civic engagement through education, analysis, outreach, and community partnerships. I'll just make a pause and wait. <laughs> with that being said, with that being said, um, as you all know, I am new to the, depart to the department, I'm new to the city as well. Uh, this was last year, uh, so of August, this has changed. So last year, my, my position was vacant. We had the, the organizational equity coordinator, Colin Sabo. He was um, filling in as interim director. And then we also had an intake specialist, Carol Spinoso. However, as of the end of September, this changed a little bit. I came in in August of 2022, and then we restructured in October. Carol, Carol Espinosa retired. So right now we have Colin Sabo serving as equity and human rights specialist. That was the new re restructuring of the department that we have done. And late, later this next month in March, we'll have the new equity and human rights specialist uh, taking on their position. The position has already been hired and the person has already accepted. With that being said, as you heard from Anderson, we too are a multicultural um, department of different things. So not only do we focus on individual rights and enforcement, but we also focus on the basic needs of intercultural skills development of diversity inclusion, as well as repair restoration, advocacy, equity plans, um, and trying to work with different organizations, whether it's internally or externally. One of our biggest partners is the Civil Rights City Attorney's Office um, that we work very closely with when we're dealing with cases from our constituents, followed by the Multicultural Family Center, which is where we're hosted, and then working, uh, obviously, hand in hand with our Human Resource Workforce Equity, as well as our Chair Office of Prosperity and Neighborhood Support. A lot of the external partners, as Anderson alluded to, are also the same for us. So we work closely with NICC, uh, MFC, the BIDA program, um, the Community Equity Profile, Crescent, um, and then also we work with his office. So we were also part of the City Life IJAC program. And actually, funny story is, Last April, I was actually part of the city life, and I really enjoyed it. And little did I know that was that by August I will be part of the bigger community on being part of the city of Dubuque organization. So um, that program I can only speak very highly of, um, not only in the way it's organized, but the way that it's structured and shows the community of the great opportunities of being part. And we were able to do so with IJAG um, a few months ago and show the young generation that human rights is also something that they can think of and be part of those conversations. So when we talk about all the partnerships, we are also have a commission of the commissioners of hum, uh, under the human rights. Right now we have four members. This again is another part of the restructuring that we're going through. Um, currently their names are listed, Carla Anderson, Alaya Harian, Maitha Jollet, and Jay Kursek. The commission has the capacity of up to nine members. So we are working very closely um, to figure out next steps probably in the next few months as we're getting candidates to um, sign up and be interested. So again, we welcome this opportunity to be a plug-in for those that are interested in learning more about the Human Rights Commission um, to call our office and be part of the solution in the long term. Fiscal year 2023 highlights. Again, as I said, I came in in August, but we're making progress. SRO's work group, we are, final, we are finalizing at the end of this month, actually in the, the last few days, um, 
with a partnership with the Dubuque Community School District and the Office of Diversity in their department, we're finalizing a focus group to um, come up with final recommendations um, of the work that the SROs and their, and their partnership is doing. DCPRC MOU, that's been in the works right now of restructuring that as well. The fines and fees work group, you heard from um, Mary Rose earlier today about her part of it. And we're working with other departments, the division program under the new community impact uh, department uh, under park and leisure services is taking the lead on that. The animal control, storytelling, and utility billing rate study. Then we also have the equitable municipal career pathways um, that Collins Ebo is seeing as well as the writer uh, mentor scholar initiative that he's overseeing currently. As for current projects, um, the Dubuque Equitable Community Grant, uh, hopefully you have seen it, that went out uh, at the beginning of February. Actually, this, past, this next Friday, March 3rd, is the last day to put in your grant application. The application will be reviewed by myself, Colin Sabo, and a couple of our commission members, and then we'll turn it around, hopefully within the next month, and by April 1st, notify who's the lucky winner of the candidate. Thanks to the approval of this, of the city council from last year, we're able to go ahead and make it in a year-to-year -year basis. So next year, we hope to be able to offer another opportunity for another um, party. The language access survey, this is something that took place probably late September, early October, that we did internally. We wanted to find out what was the need from our department across the city to have departments in the city have translation services and not stereotype and not just say, well, they look Latino, they look non-native speakers, we'll just help see what we can do. And we're also seeing an increase as we are continuously working with different departments to provide equity, the need to have not only translation but interpretation services. So this assessment has allowed us to recognize those needs. Our hope is to have it by the late, um, late spring, early summer, a report out in which we can share best practices with other in, with internal uh, departments and then move on to external um, partnerships. Because we see this continuous need of a phone call saying, hey, does your department offer translation services? And the reality is no, we don't, but we really want to help them. And just like any other department, I would say that I have learned in the city of Dubuque, we are here for the community and we want to make sure that the needs of our constituents are being met. So yes, we'll help them, we'll refer them, we'll see what we can do. ICC trainings are intercultural competency trainings. That is being restructured as well. That is something that we're trying to align and work together with the Office of Human Resources to create DEI competencies, to move that forward internally so that our departments can have those intercultural competency experiences so that they can communicate not only internally with someone that's different in order to uh, be able to work more thoroughly and retain current employees, but also be exposed to working with external, external partners or external team members and that they can do so without stereotypes and without um, fear of how do you communicate with someone without knowing their language. The update on equity and human rights brochures, that is one of the pieces that I don't know if you noticed. The first slide had the logo that it has been revamped for our department, and we have updated the brochures. Uh, the brochures were updated late, this, late December, and we are hoping to go ahead and do, do that as part of our new highlights for, uh, for the next year. When we talk about creating an, equity, an equitable community and organizational of choice, we talk about resilience. Resilience is the staff structuring of the department to maintain long-term success. Um, obviously, as you can see, we are short but mighty. Uh, we're building the team up from the zero ground. Um, there's a long history of equity of the program of human rights. However, after COVID, I think it, we're getting a new facelift, <laughs> not only in the director, but also the, in the um, way that we want to do and move forward. 
careful stewardship of the money. We gotta be conservative and we know that. We gotta be wise, wise stewards with the, uh, where our constituents' dollars. Sustainability. Community engagement efforts, including marketing participation in community events and discussions. This is something that we want to do the next, the, this upcoming year. We want to go ahead and continue to build those community engagements so that people know what is human rights. Sometimes people have no idea what the department entails or what it does or what it's there for. They just say, oh, I have a problem, I'll just call equity and human rights. No, but we want to go ahead and show them how can, they, how can we go ahead and help them be participants in their community and know their rights um, so that they can live in better conditions. Equity, the equitable community grant that we talked about, and then the we're gonna continue working with the equity fines and fees programs and the ICC's trainings. But at the end, it's the compassion. Compassion being the staff's restructuring to enhance the process of the complaint and intake processing. Again, that's a partnership that we have with um, the city attorney's office. When we talk about future initiatives, we're talking about marketing and rebranding services to the community. As I mentioned, sometimes people don't know what they don't know, but I think it's the time is right, right now is to get out there and not only rebrand the Office of Equity and Human Rights, but to get the word out there. Tell them the who, the how, the when, the why, uh, where, and what is it that we do. Outreaching and knowing your rights sessions in the community. Our hope is to be able to offer it, not only in Spanish, but in Marshallese, but also to eventually offer it in other languages. There's more than 20 languages in our city that our Dubuque Community School District encounters every day in the classroom. So how do we do that? One of the programs that we're starting to uh, do a little bit of research and see perhaps, um, depending if we can find equitable resources, is to do the city cultural ambassadors. The city cultural ambassadors would be creating connectors with our community so that they can help and they can be the voice within their community. In other words, let's say that um, we have a Marshallese person. The Marshallese person would be a Marshallese constituent, could serve as a, as a cultural ambassador. He or she or they would go ahead and be the voice of that community they would go ahead and get notifications from all of our different departments and know how they can help. So in time of crisis or just in time to, uh, for a fun event, they could go ahead and say that message in their language and know how to best get the attention of their community versus us trying to figure out, is this the way we do it? Is this the way that we shouldn't do it? Because I am not an expert on every single language or in every single culture that we have in our city. However, I do know that there are people that are, and the best way is to get the people themselves to connect with their own kind. Blood calls blood, and that's normal. That's human nature. So what better way than to say, hey, we have a city that's diverse, and why not pull in all of these individuals to be those city cultural ambassadors. And then the department equity plans. As I am new, uh, I am learning that we need to get back to those department equity plans and see how we can enhance them. See how we can make sure that they are not a stale document. They need to be a living document in which all the departments every year need to go ahead and figure out what can I do to improve what I did last year to make, a, make it better this year when thinking through the equity lens? When we talk about the requested property tax support, we're looking at $6.27 for the average homeowner's property tax cost. And then $434,275 for the tax request. Last but not least, as you can see from the PowerPoint, this is an example of the brochure that, that is already uh, out, uh, that we will be in the next upcoming community events showcasing with our team to make sure that people know what is it that we can do to enhance their lives and make them a little bit more equitable and show that there's human rights in the city of Dubuque. Thank you so much for your time. All right, well thank you very much. So before we come back to us here, do we have any uh, public input for this particular presentation? I see no one here. Do we have any virtual? No virtual input. All right. Thank you, Adrian. Back to the table then for any discussion. Yes, Ms. Roussel. 
I'd just like to say I love the idea of the city cultural ambassadors. I can't wait to see what you're going to do with that. I think it's a great idea. People love to hear from their friends and people in their own community, and what a great idea. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Wethel? All right. Um, I want to point out, you have a lot of moving parts right now in things that are going on. And I think, I think my sense, and you tell me if I'm, if I'm right or wrong here, but um, I think my sense is that as things have grown and changed within the city of Dubuque organization, I mean, the, the presentation right before you is an example of this, the, the uh, identity of the Office of Equity and Human Rights has really shifted over time, sure. hasn't it? I mean, and, and you're kind of, you're coming in on this time when a lot is changing all at the same time. And um, I very much appreciate, you know, that you are, I think, I liked the future initiatives in your last slide here. You're, you're pointing out some of the pretty specific ways that you want to try to focus in on the important things that are, that are happening right now in the midst of all these changes, because that's a, that's a challenge to have to adjust to all the changes that are happening all at the same time there. Um, so I appreciate you doing that. So thank you very much for, for pointing all those things out. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the department equity plans because that was one of my questions. You know, it was the same number as last year on your performance indicators. It's the same number of departments that have equity plans. And um, you took that even further because my question was, why don't, how come we, every single department doesn't have an equity plan yet? But you went one further and said, we've taken our eye off of that and we need to focus on it again a little bit more to make sure that um, we're not just creating equity plans, but renewing them on an annual basis and making sure that we're a living example of the things we're trying to encourage in the community as well. Um, the last thing I have is a question that comes from complete ignorance, so I'm just going to warn you about that. Um, but translation services, you know, I, I imagine that with technology changing, these have also grown and changed. It used to be that in order to provide any sort of translation service, it would need to be a person who was right there in person, which I think is probably still ideal. but are there other options out there? And I mean, what, what kind of things do we have to, or resources do we have to work with to be able to provide the translation services for the many different languages that are, that are spoken here in Dubuque? Right, right now, we are looking into them. I can tell you that, unfortunately, for example, Marshallese is one of the hardest resources to factor. Um, it's a dialect, it's not a, it's not a, a language, it is a language, but it's, it's only a dialect, as some people would say. So what well, we can look into Google Translate for Spanish or for French, unfortunately, we cannot find under Google uh, something as Marshallese. So we are looking into, our office is looking into seeing what we can do, how we can learn to do best practices, because, unfor because the reality is we are not translating to 20, to 20 plus doc documents. We're only focusing right now on the two biggest uh, populations. However, there's an increase of the Guatemalan community as, as well, as we know from our partners. And the Guatemalan community speaks a dialect. It's not Spanish. So what can we do? It's an effort, of, it's a continuous effort of keep researching, keep moving forward. As I mentioned, um, I'm coming in and I'm learning as quickly as I can all the different needs of the changing, not because not only due to COVID, the changing environment, but also the structure and the needs and what the needs of our constituents are. I feel that in some ways, um, in the last year, year and a half, some things may not have moved as quickly as accurate, uh, being that um, equity plans that you were mentioning. The reason that they are still the same is because no, nobody has done anything, to be honest. They had not, prior to me coming, nothing had been done. So I cannot speak for what had not been done or why the last two years were the same reports. I can only speak for the actions that I, in the last six, six months that I have taken. Sure. <laughs> Well, and I think it's completely understandable given the transition within the department. So I, yeah. that I, I want you to, I want to be clear on my question. That's not a, that's, right. that, that's not no, saying no. that anybody did anything yeah. wrong. Um, it was just a, I, I was glad to see your focus on it because I think it is important. And I know that this has been a period of transition as the, the whole department has been changed and, you know, other departments have been created around it. And I think that it's um, finding your identity really is important in that. So I think that's all I had. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none. Thank you very much. It was Thank good you having you much. here for your first presentation with us, <laughs> and we very much appreciate it. 
Our final presentation of the evening is the finance department. I feel like you present every finance, every budget presentation, but we're looking forward to hearing from you. All right. Let me see if I get out, out of this. There we go. All right. Good, good evening, Mayor and City Council, Jennifer Larson, Chief Financial Officer. Um, I have the pleasure to present the Finance Department budget tonight. I'm also joined by Utility Billing Supervisor Rose Horner and uh, Purchasing and Risk Manager Tony Breitbach. Uh, Rose will actually be helping me with the presentation. She'll be handling utility billing. So. Uh, let me go ahead. So the finance department mission statement and vision statement were written by employees of the finance department. Uh, the city of Dubuque finance department promotes excellence internally through all encompassing communication, support, and teamwork and strives for authentic connections between unique individuals to create harmonious service to our citizens and coworkers. So that's our mission statement. Our vision statement is to create an environment that is inclusive, transparent, accessible, and forged by clear communication, providing dependable customer service in a fun and enjoyable environment. We are unique, we are Dubuque. And with that, I'd also like to thank my staff in the finance department, um, utility billing, budget, and accounting. There's a lot that gets accomplished in the department and a lot of challenges, um, any, anything from vacancies and just changes in, uh, software systems or other challenges that come up and they always beat those challenges and exceed uh, expectations. So big shout out to the finance department staff. We do have two new faces in the department. We have Kaya, Kaya Humpall, who is the confidential account clerk. She started August 29th of 2022. She came from the Dubuque Community School District. And we have budget finance uh, analyst Joe Link. He started August 8th, 2022. He's a recent graduate of UNI. So happy to have both on board. Uh, the finance department also has an investment oversight commission. Uh, so this is a three year term. Uh, we meet quarterly. And the purpose is to make sure that all investments are following the city's investment policy. Uh, the money managers also make presentations at those quarterly meetings, uh, so there's opportunity to learn about our portfolios and for the commission to ask uh, questions of the money managers. And I'm happy to say that we have all of our uh, seats filled on the commission, so that's been very helpful. This is the current finance department organizational chart, so we are approved for 23.51 full-time equivalents. We currently have five vacant positions. Uh, we have a finance director position vacant since August of 2022 uh, when the assistant director of finance uh, left. Uh, we had a new position created. It was an assistant finance director position, later changed to budget director. That's been vacant since July 18th. Uh, budget financial analyst position vacant since January. And we had a newly created position, purchasing safety coordinator. Uh, that was created January 3rd. Um, we're looking to start uh, posting for that. And then limited term accountant, that was a position approved to assist utility billing with ERP implementation. Uh, for the finance and budget director positions, we're actually looking at using an outside recruiting firm to hopefully help fill those positions. So we'll be starting that process um, in the next week or so. Uh, moving into creating an equitable community of choice. Under uh, budget, we always include equity in our budget process. So every department that submits a capital project or an improvement package has equity questions that they must complete. They also must answer an overall department equity overview question. And we typically hold equity and budgeting uh, training for departments. We were not able to do that this year due to um, having to train all departments on the new budget module, but we plan to train on that in the future. 
Uh, we also help educate grant, contract, and purchase the service partners about the city's racial equity goals and engage them in supporting efforts to achieve racial equity. And then we try to provide various platforms for residents to pers participate in community engagement, both in person and online. So we'll continue looking at expanding that. In finance, we do have an equity plan. Uh, so we are working on maintaining and develop, developing opportunities for minority business enterprises to participate as a city debut vendor or service provider. Uh, so we're working towards developing an, an ongoing list of local targeted small businesses in conjunction with the state certified target small business for city procurements. Uh, looking at tracking vendor demographics and other data related to procurements in the new ERP system, evaluating the city insurance schedules to make sure we're not limiting vendor participation in procurement, while also providing outreach to aid vendors in understanding what the insurance coverage requirements are. And uh, Tony Breitbach in the finance department meets uh, quarterly uh, to discuss those opportunities and outreach with the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support, Economic Development, Engineering, and the Equity and Human Rights Department. Under utility billing, we've been offering payment plans to customers with delinquent balances since March of 2020. We also offer water, sanitary, sewer, uh, stormwater and refuse base fee reduction for those who are in income qualified. Uh, utility Billing Supervisor Rose Horner participates in the Landlord City meetings and also goes to the Landlord Association meetings. And Rose also participates in the Equitable Fine and Fee, fee Reform uh, movement and participates in those meetings. Uh, jumping into some of the prior year highlights, uh, Tony Breitbach is the chair of the Dubuque, uh, City of Dubuque Safety Committee. So that is a committee that has individuals from all levels of the organization, as well as outside representatives from the Iowa Community, Communities Assurance Pool, or ICAP, Iowa Municipalities Workers Compensation Administration, and then also the city's general liability agent, who is O'Connor and English Insurance Agency. And then that committee works closely with the human resources team to review and implement changes. So the goals of that safety committee are to establish a culture of if you see something, say something for everything regarding safety, uh, establish clear safety training programs across all departments, and then also make sure new hires have an onboarding process and provide a safe, healthy workplace every day for city employees. There are also safety subcommittees, so there's an incident review team that reviews injur injuries, incidents, and accidents. That team meets monthly and as needed, and that team makes recommendations and evaluates how to prevent future occurrences. And that team also reviews anonymous near-miss reports submitted from the city's website. There's a safety training team that assists in recommending trainings for departments. So all new hires are required to take three safety-related courses. All employees will be required to take nine core safety-related courses, regardless of their role at the city. And then there are over 30 available courses to be assigned out, depending on the role that employee serves within the organization. Uh, those courses are uh, tracked through NeoGov Learn platform. And then there's a safety audit team that performs job site and facili facilities walkthroughs and audits. So jumping into the finance department itself, we had a pretty exciting year. We had successful implementation of the Tyler Muniz Enterprise Resource Planning System for finance and budget. We went live July 1st, 2022, and we survived it, and we're actually thriving somewhat now. Um, we pr also provided as par part of that process extensive hands-on citywide Tyler training beginning in April of 2022. And we are continuing training for departments, um, getting ready to do another round of that for them. We also changed auditors, so we changed from Ide Bailey to Forvis LLP out of West Des Moines. So um, it's always a little bit of a challenge to switch auditors and have them learn our system, but it's also been good to have a new set of eyes on our financials. So um, we haven't quite completed our fiscal year 22 audit, but hopefully 
this month, I, as in March, hopefully we'll complete that and bring that presentation to city council. Another big item that we implemented was a new government accounting standards board, number 87 on leases. Um, so the object objective of this was to meet, better meet the information of financial statement users by improving accounting and reporting for leases by governments. Um, so this was a pretty large undertaking. The city has about 150 leases. Uh, we had to purchase a software called Lease Query to track that and calculate the journal entries. We worked in conjunction with the city attorney's office. Um, we also used Ide Bailey Consulting to have them help us review those leases because we just did not have enough staff to get through it in time to write the financial statements. Uh, we also received the GFOA Certificate of Achievement for 2021 Annual Certified Report. That's the 34th consecutive year. So going back to the ERP system implementation, I would just like to give a big thanks to the mayor and city council for your support of the project, the city manager for his support, and there were a lot of departments and staff involved. Um, shout out to information services staff, uh, Scott Schlichty, uh, Jake Hoffman, and Joe Pregler, all the department managers that supported their staff when they had to go through training, um, and they also had to go through training as well. And of course, the clerical and support staff, all the system users, it was a huge change, a lot of process changes. Um, and they all did a great job through that process. And of course, the finance staff, um, each uh, person spearheaded their expertise area. And we had a lot of success with that um, process. So I'm going to walk through. Um, how we got to going live, it was a very lengthy process. It started in August of 2018 when City Council made the ERP system a high priority. Our old system is over 30 years old. It had an outdated chart of accounts, difficult budget reporting. There was no centralized tracking for receivables, extensive use of paper for employee files, time entry, payroll, and cash receipts. So definitely time to make a change. When we started the process, our vision for the ERP system was one version of truth as far as um, the data in the system, sharing of e ease of sharing information, transparency, implementing um, paperless workflows and approvals, uh, improving internal controls, budget monitoring, and of course security, mobile applications, disaster recovery and business continuity, and use of cloud technologies. So. That was our vision when we started this process. Um, in the beginning, uh, council approved us in September 2019 to contract with the Government Finance Officers Association Research and Consulting Center to help us through the process. They had a lot of experience with implementation, so it was great to have them on board as a partner. In January of 2020, we uh, kicked off the process and the planning process. We held a kickoff meeting with all departments uh, February 2020, that is when the budget was established. So in 21 and 22, there was a $2.4 million total budget established for the project. In February through July of 2020, uh, staff reviewed and revised business processes for process mapping. So all departments um, involved in those processes were part of that, those activities. In July of 2020, we held a work session with city council on the ERP process project. In August of 2020 through January of 2021, um, staff focused on determining what was needed in the new ERP system. So what did the future look like? And again, we had all departments that would use the software involved in that process. Um, and then we wrote the request for proposal, um, completed software demonstrations, and recommended a software vendor. In July 2020, we released the request for proposal. August of 2020 through December 2021, or sorry, 2020, uh, we reviewed the proposals. We did software interviews, software de demonstrations. Again, we had any departments that would touch that portion of the software be involved in those demonstrations. And we also asked departments to submit feedback forms on the software modules that they saw demonstrated. In January 2021, we recommended a software contract to the city manager and approval to negotiate in order to bring it back to city council. 
And then in March 2021, we did um, client reference checks for Tyler Muniz, and we had them do some additional software demonstrations. In April of 2021, um, we started process improvement team training for the software power users. In April, also that month, City Council approved the Tyler Muniz contract. And then in May of 2021, we began the Tyler implementation sessions with um, the Tyler consultants. December 21 through April 2022, we did system process refinement. April through May of 2022, then we had to validate the system. Um, and then July 1st, 2022, we went live, but it didn't end there. Um, we also established an ERP hotline and an ER we used um, information services ticketing system specifically for ERP to make sure um, users could get the help that they needed. And then July through August of 2022, uh, we were trained on the budget module training. So this fiscal year 24 budget was created in the new system. So there was a lot to learn there. So it was a very lengthy process, um, over two years long, but um, a lot of great planning and successful implementation. Um, so moving on to budget, uh, I just touched on it, but we did annual department training, and this year it was on how to use the new budget module in Tyler Muniz ERP system. And I have to say it's a very robust budget system. I'm very impressed with it. And we've only scratched the system there, so excited to um, use more of the things available in it in upcoming budget years. Uh, we also created new budget reports for budget documents using the new system. And then we created automatic year-to-date budget reports that get sent out to every department the 15th of each month. And on the budget side, we received GFOA's Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for the 23 but fiscal year 23 budget. So that was our 17th consecutive year on that one. Um, also in finance for future initiatives, uh, we have ERP uh, implementation implementation still happening. So human resources, they go live July 2023. Finance is involved in that implementation. Uh, we also have another module, asset management implementation, that will start in September 2023. So that's specific for tracking fixed assets for our financial statements. And then we uh, will continue finance and budget department training so that we can use the system more and more to its ability as we do more training. And we have another government accounting standard uh, statement that we have to implement, which is number 96. That's on subscription-based information technology arrangements. Um, so again, it's reviewing those agreements. Um, we'll be using iBailey again to help us with that process and we'll leverage uh, lease query, the software we purchased for the lease portion to track these leases as, as well. Uh, also under finance, we're looking at doing a request for a proposal for debt and investment management software. So originally when we did the ERP system, we had planned on implementing this at the same time. However, inadvertently in the contract process, part of this was left out. So we made the decision we would go out for a separate RFP after we went live um, with the other system. Uh, we also are looking at doing a request for a proposal for a new purchasing card vendor that will integrate better with our ERP system, give some mobile capability of taking pictures of receipts and um, being able to reconcile your purchasing card more easily. And uh, also looking at electronic bid submittal implementation. So a lot still on the horizon uh, being implemented. Under budget, we'll continue to try to expand budget engagement, especially with the new ERP system. Uh, continue implementing equity tools and measures into the budget process. And then we'll definitely be looking at process improvements for the fiscal year 25 budget. With the human resources part going live, we will have access to position control. And that will be a huge um, positive change in budget. Right now we're budgeting for all employee expense outside the system in um, Excel spreadsheets. So being able to import live updated data is pretty exciting for employee expense, and we're also going to look at expanding the use of all the features that are available in the budget module. So just a reminder of everything that we do in the finance department. We do everything from financial policy, cash management, 
accounting payroll, utility billing, budget, all the way down to legislative analysis. And in the budget office, I briefly touched on some of the online tools we're trying to use. So we've been using Open Budget, Balancing Act, Taxpayer Receipt, um, just as another way for residents to interact with the city's budget and give their input. Um, we also, of course, develop, manage the city's annual operating and five-year uh, capital improvement plan, and we produce the budget documents each year. So just a look at the Balancing Act simulation. Um, it has decreased a little bit. We're hoping to increase this, but we had about 252 page views um, for the 2024 budget. Uh, requested property tax support, it's $14.86 to the average homeowner. And just a brief summary of some of our performance measures. So we're on track with the GFOA Certificate of Excellence for financial reporting and also for budget presentation and the number of UB customers using direct payment. Our goals improving are the percent of city water customers using the WaterSmart water management portal and the number of individuals reached through budget public engagement sessions. And we're working on increasing the number of residents who actually submit um, a balancing act budget simulation. So some of our online tools that can be accessed through the website, we have the dollars and cents uh, brochure that Randy Gale produces. We also have Open Budget, Balancing Act, Taxpayer Receipt, and Open Expenses. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rose for utility billing. You're good. OK. Good evening, Mayor Cavanaugh, City Council. I'm Rose Horner, the utility billing supervisor. Rose, if you um, want to move the desk down, you can. Just to your right, there's a little switch right there, and the whole thing can go down. Say what? The, the whole desk that you're here. Oh. Abhishek is going to help you. Yeah, you. that way you can. <laughs> it's nice to see more than just eyes when you're talking to somebody I, sometimes. I couldn't see Rick Jones. <laughs> I know. <laughs> until I moved, so. so it's, this button. it's nice to be able to see Thank everybody. Um, I'd like to start out by just acknowledging the utility billing staff. Um, they, they work hard every day to keep us moving forward. That through their input, their ideas, and their teamwork, we are able to maintain over 24,000 accounts and provide fast, efficient service to our customers. Um, our, our team uh, consists of Brandy Baumhover, Vicki Wilwert, Hunter Smith, <coughs> Dawn Carr, Chuck Harris, Jenny Hurtis, Chris Valley. And our intern, uh, college intern, is Tim Miller. So this first slide just kind of gives an overview of what the utility billing department does. Um, uh, we, we bill for four utilities, 24,000 meters in service. Um, customer database, again, is a little over 24,000 accounts. WaterSmart is our uh, customer service portal. We use the State of Iowa's offset program for collections as well as a collection agency on unpaid uh, debt. We collect parking tickets and uh, we issue ut uh, stickers for garbage, yard waste, and large item pickup. WaterSmart is our customer service platform that provides uh, lots of different tools and resources for our customers. We have uh, about 48% of our customers are registered and using WaterSmart on a regular basis. And that's a total of 24, over 24,000 accounts again. So we've got about 48% registered users. The platform monitors water usage, but it also allows you to set up alerts if there's a potential um, unusual usage, water usage. You can enroll in paperless billing and view your bills online. You can download those as well, but you don't have to be enrolled in paperless billing to be able to see your bills. Excuse me. Um, you can pay your bills online, one-time payments, or you can set up automatic payments through your bank account or a credit or debit card through WaterSmart. 
Fiscal year highlights include increasing the numbers in um, some of our higher areas, paperless billing, automatic payment, that's both through the utility account and through our WaterSmart portal. Phone and online payments increased, and uh, registered WaterSmart users. Then down on the bottom, you can see the number of customers enrolled and are, that are receiving reduced base fees on their utilities. Uh, the numbers from 2023, sorry, from 2023, have decreased compared to 2022, but that's because of a reporting um, snafu that we found the beginning of 2023. In 2022 and prior years, the numbers were inflated because some of our customers who were no longer receiving those discounts were included in the numbers. The total dollar amount issued was correct, but the total number of customers receiving the discounts was not. So that's why it's down a little bit. Um, for our reduced fee base, reduced base fee program, we do try to promote as much as we can um, everywhere we can and, and look forward to opportunities to actually increase those numbers. Uh, this listing gives, this is a list of the um, places that we do promote this. The one thing that, we're, that we haven't mentioned on here is that we talk to people about it all the time. When they call in and are looking for either assistance financially or a payment plan, we'll mention the reduced fee program as well. Fiscal year highlights include increasing the number of payment plans um, or providing those, those payment plans, I'm sorry. Um, you can see that on the top, we started the payment plan program in July of 22 as a, um, an, a resource for people when we started uh, disconnections again after, after the COVID recess that we had. Um, so we've currently got, uh, at any one time, we have about 100 people actively on the program. Um, but we have assisted 484 accounts since July of 2020, and uh, they have um, been able to pay back over $180,000. The state of Iowa Disruption Prevention Program was in place between November and December of 2020. That program is no longer in place, but it did provide assistance as well. Um, and the same for the Iowa Finance Authority. HACAP has provided a, a big chunk of, of resources to people, financial assistance, and then so has the American Rescue Plan. This diagram shows the progress that we've made over the last four years for um, delinquent balance, delinquent balances. The purple line is 2023, and that's where we're at right now. So we're a little bit above where we were in 2020, um, but I feel pretty good about that compared to where we were. Um, continuing on the 2023 highlights, um, the, the financial assistance, we continue to work really closely with, with area programs to be able to assist customers who get behind on their utility bills. We've made some process improvements as far as the ease of applying for service and for any other program. Basically, all you need is a smartphone. We've got a QR code for just about everything, and you can apply pretty easily that way. Um, we're, we're in the process of training and um, planning to implement our new utility billing software August 1st. So that's going pretty well. The property tax lien and collection agency, we resumed that last year and we do have that on a, a regular um, schedule right now. Future initiatives are the go live August 2023 with our Tyler ERP. 
We're going to continue to try and reduce the delinquent utility balances through our financial assistance programs and payment plans. We are going to implement a tablet or an iPad for customers to be able to use to apply for service at the utility window if they do not have the option to do it over the phone or any other way and they come into the window they want to apply for service, they'll be able to do it right there pretty easily. And we're looking forward to the Tyler software. It's going to be a challenge because it'll be different, but there are definitely some improvements we're already seeing. One of the biggest ones is such a little thing, but we're going to be able to run reports in Excel rather than PDF and converting them to Excel. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, there's also going to be some improvements as far as our notices and letters that we send out. Um, we're going to increase our marketing efforts for reduced fees, try to get those numbers um, up there if we can for the people who we know probably could take advantage of that. We'll continue to do staff development and there will be a succession planning process for the retirement of the utility billing supervisor, although no date has been set yet. That's it. Is that, a, Thank you. is that an example of saving the best for last right there? Well, <laughs> I sort of snuck that in. <laughs> Thank you both for your presentation. So um, first of all, do we have any public input? I see no one here. Do we have any virtual input? No virtual input. Okay. Back to the table then for any discussion. Ms. Farber. So I'm not sure if this is for Jennifer or for the soon-to-be-retired supervisor. Um, regarding, number one, for the IR the ERP rollout, congratulations. That is a major undertaking, and it sounds like you guys have really stepped up to the plate, and um, it is iterative, and I know it is very time-consuming and very detailed, um, and so very much appreciate all that you've done to make the city more efficient for all of the residents that use our facilities. Um, and 24,000 homes is quite a large amount, so I'm sure they're very appreciative, and hopefully we'll be uh, better served uh, again as you upgrade to to that new um, software package. Um, I do have a question on the supplies and services where you increased um, printing from 20, 27,000 to 130,000 from 23 to 24. I just thought that figure was a little large. Sure. So in I believe it was in fiscal year 2022, we started outsourcing the printing of utility bill, bills. Mm -hmm. So in that line item, it includes the postage that they use to send that as well as the printing costs. So it's just combined in one invoice and all paid from that line item. So yeah. postage would have went down and that line item increased. Yeah, okay, thank you, because it just yep. kind of stuck out on the, yep. on the listing here. Thank you very much. And again, thank you guys for all that you do and for all of the, um, groundwork that you do to help us every year for the budgeting process is just greatly appreciated. Ms. Wethel, I see no more hands raising here. You have anything? I do not, Mayor, but just thank you all for your commitment to community. Um, you do such great work. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So two, two quick things from me. Um, First of all, uh, ideas for utility billing stuff. I saw. I didn't see it on the list, so I'm just going to mention them. Just if, if you've already thought of it, wonderful. I'm just going to I'm going to throw them out there. Um, I know a number of people at this desk uh, do a lot of assistance with food, uh, or do a lot of work with food assistance services. So uh, places where people are going for extra food or um, the, the food giveaways and those types of things. Um, you know, the ability for those to be in boxes that go out or anything like that can always be very useful. Um, there's a, a whole host of agencies I know that do that and are seeing a pretty increased number of people who are looking for food assistance right now. Um, Resources Unite is another example of uh, you know giving out information for people. Um, the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support, you know, with neighborhood organizations, but then also also the events and things that they're they're doing on a regular basis. That um, National Night Out in August is a great example. The uh, back to school bash is something that uh, Anderson Sancy is always coordinating and those types of things are always useful. And then I was thinking of our community partners, or our, I'm sorry, our county partners as well. So, um, you know, DHS, Department of Human Services and places like that uh, that we might not have thought of. But then also Crescent, um, you know, they've, with the increased number of people that they're seeing who are coming in for uh, low cost services, I think 
might be a good place to go. So just some ideas in, in, case, in case those weren't on the radar. The other thing, I, I, I feel like this cannot go without being mentioned, the, um, the vacancies. Um, Jennifer, thank you <laughs> for doing all the work and everybody in your team for, for doing the work. I mean, you're, you're literally doing three jobs um, and two of those jobs are director jobs and then you are the chief financial officer. I mean, this is not sustainable. We all recognize that. I, I noticed that you didn't ask for anything extra on top of what we're doing. So you, what I'm hoping that you're gonna tell me is that the, you think that the next step of looking with, um, get somebody to recruit is where we hope to be able to do this. I mean, is there anything else we need to be doing? I know this is a problem across the board for a lot of people. Finance is a tough gig to, bring people to city government when there's a lot of different jobs in finance, but I'm just curious if there's anything else you can tell us or need to. Um, we're hoping with an outside recruiter, we can you know, hopefully hit some markets that we weren't reaching. Uh, as part of that, uh, they are doing a market analysis study for both of those director positions to make sure they're priced at the appropriate level before the recruitment begins. Um, so I'm not sure if they'll stay at where they were budgeted or if that will change, but hopefully we'll know in the next couple of weeks. But um, we have been utilizing um, a temporary uh, employment agency, uh, GovUSA HR, I probably got that backwards. Um, so we do have a retired uh, finance director helping us uh, remotely, which has been a huge help. So I'm glad that we were able to find him. He's very experienced and has gone through ERP implementation, so he always offers suggestions, and we appreciate those. Um, so we're, we're trying all the avenues we can think of to get temporary assistance. Uh, if we are able to bring on a uh, finance director, uh, our assistant director who left now uh, works for a public accounting agency, and they've, she has agreed to do some consulting to help train the person if they're brought on board, which is always, you know, a, a struggle as well. Once you uh, get new staff on board, you know, it's important to train them and onboard them. And, you know, hopefully we're able to fill both the budget and finance director positions. And I would focus on training the budget uh, director and hopefully uh, Cassie Ross, who left, can uh, train the finance director position as long as we can get the recruitment done timely. Um, so she has time available between April and June, hopefully, to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, we're doing everything we can think of at this point. So and yeah, I'd also like to say thanks to Tony Breitbach. He's taken a lot of the burden of helping manage the department. And Rose, you know, runs a great u utility billing department. So mm -hmm. I never have any worries there. So. Well, and I know you have a great team, and that's how you're making it work, and we appreciate yep. that very much, and I hope the people of Dubuque do too. I, um, you know, any vacancy is a, is a challenge, and any vacancy is concerning, but there are some vacancies that are extra concerning, and these two concern me just because of the fact that um, they're, they're incredibly key positions for everything that we do in the city of Dubuque. So I wish you the best on that. Thank you for your problem solving on that as well, because um, I know that you're working really hard to get it done, so thanks for sharing that with us. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Well, I see no other comments this evening, so with no further business in this budget session, we are adjourned. <laughs>